watching on the live stream. Good morning, welcome to the urban planning meeting for January 19th, 2021. I'm hearing a lot of noise. Uh, and uh, it's our first meeting of the year, so welcome everyone. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna start with a roll call. First, we'll do committee members. Uh, Councillor Banga, Vice Chair. President. Uh, Vice Thank Audio you. in the East Cry, please. Sorry, Councillor Banga, I wasn't sure what you had indicated. I just indicated that uh, I would be on audio. Okay. Only. Okay. Audio is fine. Thank you. And Councillor Katarina? Good morning. Good morning. And Councillor Henderson? I'm here. He's here live and in person. Um, that is the committee. Um, we also are, could be joined by members of council. If you're other members of council, could you identify yourself? John Zadok here. Good morning. Good morning, Andrew Nack here. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Osler, Michael is here. Thank you, Councillor Walters, thank you. Great, that's all Mayor I Mayor Iveson. And Mayor Iveson, who was also on the committee. Um, so uh, the first item we have is the adoption of the agenda, um, and I'm going to go to Councillor Henderson. Um, I, I will move this. Um, I'm wondering, and I don't know if this is the right time to do this, but there has been a request I gathered from some of our speakers that we not um, deal with all four items as one item, and I'm not quite sure how to deal with that, I think because they want to be able to speak to items individually. So uh, 6.1 seems to be the one that wants to get carved out. So I know it's in our agenda right now that they would be all linked, but probably this is the appropriate time to ask that question, is it not? Yeah. Okay. So I don't know what the mechanism, I mean, I know, we could, I know we could sever them. I know the committee can do that, but I just wondered what the implications of that would be. And I'm not sure um, if, uh, I, I, I suspect it's because some of the people who want to speak to 6.1 also want to speak to some of the other items as separate items. So I, if that's my understanding, Madam Chair. Okay, um, uh, Madam Clerk, I, I'm not sure if people have indicated which items they wish to speak to, if that would create a challenge. Do we have people that have signed up for more than one item? I... No, um, at this point, there are a couple of speakers registered for all four items, but most other speakers have registered on one. Um, that said, that doesn't prevent you from dealing with all four together. It's, it's really at the will of committee if, if you want to proceed. And I guess the other question I have is, uh, Ms. McCabe, I'm not sure if your presentations have been planned together. Uh, that would be the other factor. We have a one presentation for all four items as they link to the uh, evolving infill roadmap and the progress on that. Madam Chair, I, I mean, I think it would be possible um, to hear, maybe, maybe, maybe the way to do this is to hear from all, hear the presentation and then we could sever after that, could we not? Yes, you could. Because I, you know, I think having the presentation all together, it would be silly to ask you to, to separate it at this point. But uh, 
But I think if there are people who want to see these as separate items, I think it does. Um, I, I guess it's hard to know without knowing how large an issue this is. That's all. I, I guess the other concern that I have is um, people are prepared to speak to all four in their five minutes. So let's start with the presentation altogether, and we'll see if we can. Uh, several later, if that's possible. So we'll take the agenda as it is presented. Right. I will move it as it's presented, and we can revisit this this issue anon. And, and Madam Chair, if I may um, offer that if there are speakers on the line who, who wish to speak to more than one item separately, uh, if they wanted to send an email to city.clerk at edmonton.ca indicating that, uh, that would give us uh, a few minutes to get a better sense of, of that and we'd be better prepared. Okay. So uh, hopefully everyone's heard that. If you're wishing to speak to more than one item, please let the clerk know. All right. Uh, any other conversation, questions about the agenda? Uh, I see no one on the board to speak to it, so I will call the vote on the agenda. I'm a yes. My token has expired according to eScribe, so I'm just resetting everything this morning. Thank you. Thank you. And we're just missing Yes, for me as well, please. We have five votes, Madam Thank Chair. Thank you, and if you could display the vote. And that is carried. Thank you very much. So now we have uh, the adoption of the minutes. Happy to move those. They've been moved by Councillor Henderson. Any errors or omissions? Not seen any indication, so please vote on the adoption of the minutes from December 1st. We have five votes. And display the vote. And that is carried. And I don't have any protocol items this morning. Um, we're at selection items for debate, but since they've all been cross-referenced, I'm going to deem that uh, uh, six one through six four are selected, and um, I would need a motion on the balance. I I'll think. move the um, I'll, I will move the balance, which is all the uh, re the the um, reschedulings. Okay, so on everything else, all the rescheduling, we'll call the vote on that. Please vote. We have five votes, Madam Chair. And display the vote. And that is carried. And can you confirm for us what we've done this morning, uh, Madam Clerk? Certainly, thank you, Madam Chair. This morning, Urban Planning Committee has passed the recommendations of the following reports without debate. Item 5.1, Intermodal Hubs Next Steps, with a revised due date of February 2nd, 2021. Item 5.2, Transit Mode Share, Increase in Impacts with a revised due date of February 2nd, 2021. Item 5.3, High Level Line Society Project Next Steps with a revised due date of February 2nd, 2021. Item 5.4, Urban Gondola Working Relationship Framework with a revised due date of February 2nd, 2021. Item 5.5, Shared Parking Impact on High Demand Parking Area with a revised due date of March 23rd, 2021. Item 5.6, Transportation Network Performance Indicators with a revised due date of March 23rd, 2021. And lastly, item 5.7 will be going up to Council for approval as it is a reroute. So that's Growth Investment Strategy with a revised due date of February 1st, 2021 at Executive Committee. Thank you very much. Um, now we'll go to request to speak. So I'll go to Councillor Henderson. Um, I will uh, move the following, um, that uh, for items, and this is all together now, so 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, and 6.4, we hear from Mick Graham from IDEA, Oscar Rutar, 
Uh, Darby uh, Knee from the Canadian Home Builders Association, Edmonton Region. Um, Don Tolsma from the same association. Scott Hayes, also from Home Builders. Uh, Kristen Merle from the Residential Info Working Group. Uh, Sharon Bolton, also from the Residential Info Working Group. Um, Jim uh, Fweet, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly from that group as well. Uh, Suzanne Cherdarchuk. Uh, from uh, that group, Doug Cox, also from that group, Jan Hardstaff, also from that group, uh, Diane Dennis, um, also from the Residential Info Working Group, uh, Bev Zubot um, from the Residential Info Working Group, Stephen Poole from the Residential Info Working Group, uh, Cassandra Haraba from the Residential Info Working Group, uh, Stephanie Kovach from Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues, Ryan Eidick, or Eidick, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, and uh, Maria Samji from Infill Development in Edmonton Association idea. Thank you, are there any other Madam Clerk? And that's in a panel, yep. Not that I'm aware of. Okay, so that's in a panel. Um, so to hear from the speakers, would you please vote? And we have five votes, Madam Chair. And display the vote. And that is carried. So we have no request for time specific. Uh, are there any councillor inquiries? Haven't been made aware of any. So at that point, we can jump right into the presentation. Um, and the presentation will cover 6.1 through 6.4. And we'll turn it over to you. Great. Good morning. Uh, there's been a really deliberative focus on infill throughout the department for a number of years now, and this focus will continue as we work to support implementation of the city plan and welcoming one more million people to Edmonton. We understand that as neighborhoods redevelop, there's many opportunities, some of them exciting, and sometimes ex associated challenges with infill. We are committed to having processes that enable and encourage infill in alignment with the city plan and at the same time, we are focused on continuing to improve our compliance activities to minimize the impact of achieving these goals in neighborhoods. I will now pass it to Kim Petrin, the Branch Manager of Development Services, to walk you through the four reports before you today. Good morning. Before you today are a number of reports related to work that is actively supporting redevelopment to enable more than 50% of new population growth to occur within already established areas of the city a target in the city plan to achieve the big city move of a rebuildable city. I'll begin with item 6.2. The infill roadmap was created to support more and better infill in Edmonton. 16 of the 25 actions are now complete and major projects related to lot grading, drainage and infrastructure capacity will continue in 2021. The roadmap's timeline concludes in 2022. However, many of the actions will require effort beyond then to create lasting and holistic solutions. These efforts will be taken up by other city initiatives, including the city plan implementation projects and the zoning bylaw renewal. As part of the roadmap, administration is working closely with EPCOR to reduce barriers to low impact development. Low impact development contributes to a number of climate and infrastructure related benefits. Using LID as a stormwater management, as a standard stormwater management techniques helps with outcomes such as reducing peak flows and storm events, clearing, cleaning stormwater, and enhancing urban habitat. Item 6.3 proposes minor amendments to the drainage bylaw 18093. These will help to facilitate the approval of low impact development on private property within the city and make us a more climate resilient city. Item 6.4 is part of Action 16 of the Roadmap. It commits the city to develop an equitable, transparent, and predictable system to share the costs of infrastructure upgrades and renewal costs for infill projects. The Infill Fire Protection Cost Share Program invests in infrastructure required to support infill development projects. The two-year pilot program recently concluded with $2.4 million were allocated and the city received 34 applications for funding. Seven development projects were supported resulting in 112 units of housing. The submissions received during the pilot informed the amount of additional program funding to be proposed through the upcoming 2022 to 2026 performance-based rate discussion. An informal survey was sent to all of the 34 applicants of the cost share pilot. 
Of the 12 responses received, 75% didn't proceed with their development project, and 50% of those cited the reason for not advancing as the prohibitive cost of associated water and other municipal infrastructure costs. 83% of the respondents agreed that the continuation of the infill fire protection cost share program will positively influence the viability of future infill projects. The work completed through the infill fire protection cost share pilot has also identified key cost avoidance opportunities through a risk-based assessment and a site-specific fire protection assessment. To date, the process has avoided $42 million in infrastructure costs while maintaining appropriate fire protection standards. Cost avoidance combined with targeted investment in supporting more and higher quality infill developments in the priority nodes and corridors of the city. The work of the pilot project has been successful in nurturing infill developments. Discussion of funding for an ongoing infill fire protection program to continue supporting infill would take place within the performance-based regulation application and related hearing process earlier in the early part of 2021. The work of the growth management framework will inform refinements to the cost share program. Cost avoidance, education and collaboration work will continue with our city building partners. In 2016, the city created the infill compliance team as an additional tool to monitor infill construction sites to help proactively monitor infill construction sites and complaints. The work of this team supports action 13 of the infill roadmap. The team's mandate is met through two approaches, education and enforcement. The infill compliance team strives to gain voluntary compliance with various provincial acts, city bylaws and permitting. Officers use site inspections as a way to advocate for better construction practices by interacting and in educating key participants in the construction process. Although administration strives for voluntary compliance, there are situations where more formal compliance processes are required, including written warnings, written orders, and tickets. The information we are presenting today relates to the 2019 construction season. Details on the 2020 season are still being compiled. Similar to past years, in 2019, the top infractions are not related to physical development deficiencies, but rather construction practices. The top infractions re resulting in tickets in 2019 are under peace officer jurisdiction and include occupying the road right of way, obstructing a highway, materials on roadway or sidewalks, and displays on the roadway. The average timelines of response for these complaint types improved by, from more than seven business days in 2018 to four business days in 2019. In speaking with our compliance team, the 2020 season construction appears to have had similar results of service demands as in previous years. Administration will continue to track and monitor infill construction complaints and any related enforcement action and incorporate this data into a new online dashboard, which will increase transparency and provide council and the public with updated information about infill compliance and enforcement. Administration's priority is to ensure safe and compliant infill construction to support more compact and attractive neighbourhoods. We continue to listen and learn from residents who share their experiences, which is not always positive, of what it is like to welcome redevelopment projects into their communities. And more specifically, Administration has undertaken a number of meetings with the Residential Infill Working Group since 2019. Over 20 activities are proposed to be undertaken by Administration in response to the feedback received from stakeholders. Thanks to the commitment of council, citizens and industry partners, we have made tremendous progress on infill and achieved the 25% infill target set in the way we grow for three consecutive years. 2020 saw us hit 30% of development through infill. Now the city plan sets our sites higher to an ambitious long-term goal of 50% growth through infill. To meet the city plan targets, Administration will continue to prove, improve and create processes, regulations, policies and programs that support infill development. The work described in these reports represents a collective effort between many stakeholders to address the infill challenges of today. Major initiatives to implement City Plan are underway to create new opportunities for redevelopment, including the zoning bylaw renewal and the projects of reimagined city building. As new issues and challenges arise, administration will draw upon the wisdom of the public and our strong relationship with stakeholders to identify solutions. Thank you, and we'd be pleased to answer any questions you have. 
Thank you. Well, before we begin hearing from speakers, I am going to do the overview um, for all the speakers, and then we'll make a decision on if we need to break them out or not. So for each item, uh, administration, well, has provided, actually for all the items, we've provided the opening remarks. And then members of the public will be invited to speak virtually using Google Meets. Each of you will have five minutes to make comments. The clerk will run the official timer. However, speakers may wish to use a timer at home too. When the speaker is finished, please stay on the line as committee may wish to ask questions at the end of the panel speakers. After the comments from the public, committee may ask questions of city administration. I want to encourage you to refrain from using the chat function in Google Meets during the meeting as it creates issues of decorum, provides unfair advantage, and interferes with the live stream. Additionally, remember to mute your microphone when you are not presenting or answering questions. If you are experiencing any difficulties, the Office of the City Clerk has resources available to facilitate communication. Please reach out to them using the contact information provided in your registration or city.clerk at edmonton.ca. Madam Clerk, did you have a sense of how many? We've only received uh, an email from one speaker uh, who did indicate that they've, they've registered to speak. Their intention was to speak on each item. Um, we, we haven't heard beyond that. So if we only have one, uh, I think we'll just keep it as planned. Um, I, I think that makes sense at this point, um, though we have considered that. So we will start with uh, the panel. And is everyone checked in and not in place? Uh, most, and our office will reach out to those who, who haven't checked in yet. And just for your awareness, Councillor Esslinger, um, the, a large majority of the speakers who registered on a specific item were actually registered on item 6.1. Okay. So just for your context. Okay. All right. I'm just wondering while we're, before we start, because we're getting, we're getting a delay here on some speaker. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's any, are we, I, I'm guessing we're looking at it, but I just thought before we get going, just to do a double check. Yes. And I, I wasn't hearing it. I was hearing it before and I was hearing it. Um, I wasn't hearing it during the presentation. So yeah. if Michael and Puneet are here and I'm sure. Great. That they'll yeah, that's why I thought I'd grab this before so we don't have to interrupt later. So yeah, they know we, we're hearing it from above us. Great. Thanks. Thank you. So we'll begin uh, with the first speaker, uh, Mick Graham from IDEA. You have five minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Let me begin by offering my gratitude for the tremendous work done by Kelly Sizer and the FRS team, as well as Betty Caria and her EPCOR team. It's been a long road and a bit of a slog at times, but everyone kept at it diligently and cheerfully to get us where we are today. When the project began, we had a vague understanding of why missing middle projects in Edmonton's mature neighborhoods remain missing. There were obvious problems with the zoning bylaws and a resistance to change from small but vocal groups of mature neighborhood residents. But as we learned, there is a fundamental deficit of water main infrastructure that is killing off a substantial number of missing middle projects. As the report shows, 27 projects didn't get built because of the cost of necessary hydrant upgrades. This means a continuing lack of housing variety in these neighborhoods which in turn means less opportunity for young families, seniors, less affluent people and newcomers to Edmonton to move into these neighborhoods. Judging by the objectives of the city plan, this isn't the Edmonton we're working to build. My takeaway from the years long effort that this program represents is that in order to meet the objectives of city plan, we are first of all going to have to figure out what upgrades to water infrastructure will be necessary to get, <clears throat> to get going on building out the primary and secondary nodes and figuring out how to finance this work. IDEA remains committed to helping to further this important initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will do, because it's a panel, we'll ask all the speakers questions once everyone has spoken. We'll now go to Oscar Rutar. 
Good morning, Madam Chair, and for and committee members. Thank you very much for listening to me speak. Uh, I have some technical difficulties. For those that don't know me, I don't think my name shows up on the screen. So it's Oscar Utar. Um, now I see Richard's name underneath my screen. This is um, my presentation on really addressing item 6.4 on the infill hydrant program. And I'm speaking um, on a personal level as opposed to representing uh, Abbey Lane Homes that I work for, just for a variety of reasons. It's my personal opinions and not necessarily corporate opinions or, or views of Canadian home builders or anybody else that we belong to. I have applied twice for funding under the program and have, twi I have been denied twice. Getting rejected twice is disappointing enough. However, trying to figure out the program has almost been impossible. Seems like it was very intentionally very opaque. The eligibility requirements were reasonably spelled out. However, the six scoring criteria are poorly defined. Only after numerous emails and long telephone discussions did I find out that each criteria was scored from zero to 10. Nowhere does it say that what gets a score of 10 or worse, a score of zero. Secondly, it was not disclosed that when determining total score, each of the scores are multiplied together. This means a score of zero in any category results in a total score of zero. Interesting way of uh, scoring, I would have to say. To add to the lack of transparency, the ranking criteria, and I think most people are familiar with it, but they are listed through one through six. One, system capabilities. Two, neighborhood renewals and arterial program. Three, location and use. Four, transit network. Five, readiness. Six, coordination. Do not match very well with the category rankings, which have been listed in the following order in correspondence to me. What I'm referring to is how it was scored. Land use and location. None of them were numbered, by the way. System capability, transit and active transportation, current state, renewal status, and project adjacency. At least the numbering, at least the order could have matched the numbering of the scoring criteria, of the ranking criteria, but it wasn't. Why the same headings and the same numerical order were not used escapes me, unless it was intended to be confusing. My two applications failed due to zero scores. The first, because construction had started. This is spelled out under readiness. My beef is that the requirement for a hydrant was not advised until an application for water service was made, which was after a foundation permit was already issued. This tells me that maybe hydrant requirements need to be advised much earlier in the building approval process. On the second application, the application failed because the project had proceeded, had not proceeded, pardon me, to at least the pre-development permit stage. The eligibility criteria clearly states only applicants, developers who have received responses for zoning applications, which are happen to apply to my project. Pre-application submissions or development permit application from the city of Edmonton are eligible to apply for funding consideration by the infill cost share project program, pardon me. These applications must have obtained advisements or conditions of approval that entail construction of a public water distribution system, which involves water mains and associated appurtenances. I obviously received this notification, otherwise I wouldn't be applying under the hydro program. After the fact, the rules seem to have changed. The takeaway from all this is that the time frame for applying between the pre-development permit meeting and the foundation permit is too short and way too late in the process. Needless to say, my experience with the hydro program has not been enjoyable. Now to the bigger picture. The real estate development business is risky enough due to fluctuating economic conditions, financing costs, commodity price fluctuations, unpredictable weather, to name a few. Utility costs for a site should not be one of the big unknowns. Applying for relief 
on cost through a big competition is not the answer either. For a pilot project, when funds are limited, maybe. However, as a permanent solution, certainly wrong. Why is there even an expectation that new infill should absorb utility cost upgrades that benefit the entire community? The utility upgrades, if needed, are most likely needed because the infrastructure is well past the original design life. Infill. Thank you, Mr. Typically in neighborhoods that are over 50 years old. The cost should be spread over the entire neighborhood or community That's as they've already time. received full benefit of the existing infrastructure. Thank you. That's your time. Um, five minutes goes by very quickly, um, but I'm sure there'll be questions later on you after some of your other uh, comments. But thank you very much. And now we'll go to Darby Kinney. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Good morning, members of Urban Planning Committee. My name is Darby Kinney, and I'm the Government Relations Manager of the Canadian Home Builders Association Edmonton Region. CHBAER is a not-for-profit organization representing more than 420 member companies in the region. For more than 65 years, CHBAER has taken a principled and long-term approach to building sustainable places to call home. I wish to begin by thanking you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the association today to item 6.1, the Annual Info Compliance Team Report. CHBAER is eager to assist the city in meeting its growth priorities in accordance with the city plan. As we prepare to welcome 1 million more people to Edmonton, our members have the ability and the expertise to provide housing in Edmonton's existing neighborhoods that meets the needs of current and future residents. However, if we want to reach intensification targets, we must see a regulatory environment that leads to greater investment in mature and established neighborhoods. This investment will come from an approach that balances infill compliance with larger city building goals, including residential densification, increased housing diversity, and housing affordability. The city's approach to infill compliance should focus on incentivizing builders who regularly achieve compliance, as opposed to applying widespread fees and enforcement tactics. One example is the $25 per day OSCAM permit, which adds significant cost to infill projects for activities that are necessary to achieve compliance with other city bylaws, including having a waste bin located on road right of way to keep sites and neighboring properties clear of construction debris. According to administration's report, since the OSCAM fee came into effect in 2019, occupying road right of way remains the most common infraction and the number of tickets has increased by nearly 30% from 2018. Fees and other forms of heavy-handed enforcement are not the solution to achieve compliance. This is especially true when they are intended to address a very small proportion of builders, but are applied to the industry as a whole. We would like to take this opportunity to strongly discourage the application of the $25 per day OSCAM permit fee citywide, which is intended to come into effect on March 1st, 2021. The city and the residential construction industry must continue to work collaboratively towards an approach to info compliance that promotes education and best practices while incentivizing rather than penalizing compliant builders. As a city building partner, CHBAER has demonstrated a commitment to working alongside the city to raise the bar for infill development. Our members are experts in the residential construction industry and continue to develop educational materials and opportunities to inform builders of the rules, regulations, and best practices for infill. For example, our members created an excavation best practices guide, which was developed in partnership with safety codes officers from the city of Edmonton. This guide was distributed to our members and was also presented at the 2020 Infill Industry Insights Symposium, an event which was hosted by the city. This is one example of the many ways we continue to educate and promote best building practices across the city. I would like to take this opportunity to highlight that Scott Hayes of Forest Civil Solutions is present on behalf of CHBAER today to answer any questions that you might have about the excavation best practices guide. In closing, Infill will continue to play an increasingly important role in how Edmonton manages growth and provides diverse housing options. Meeting Infill development targets will require trust and shared accountability between the city, the residential construction industry, and the neighbors who are welcoming new homes and families into their communities. CHBAER is eager to discuss more opportunities to incentivize builders who are integrating growth into mature neighborhoods. Thank you, and I'll be pleased to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much for your presentation, and we'll now go to Don Tolzman, or Tolzma, my sorry. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Urban Planning Committee. My name is Don Tolzma, and I'm here today on behalf of the Edmonton, or the Canadian Home Builders Association, Edmonton Region, where I also serve on the Board of Directors. I am also the president of Timberhouse Developments, and I'm proud to be part of this network and community of builders in Edmonton who strive to raise the bar for infill across the city. 
Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm here today to speak on item 6.1 of the Infill Compliance Team Report. The residential construction industry in Edmonton is a network of local businesses that represents more than 26,000 jobs, 1.9 billion in annual wages, and 3 billion in annual investment. The CHBA ER members have built more than 75% of new units across the city. Our new members, or our members, are eager to continue to work with the City of Edmonton to fulfill the development outcomes of the city plan. To realize the intensification in the city plan, compliant builders need a supportive regulatory business environment that effectively balances infill compliance activities with larger city building goals. Heavy handed approaches such as the $25 a day OSCAM permit fee do not effectively promote compliance and instead create regulatory and financial burden for the infill builders. Fees that are intended to curb the activities of a small number of builders add significant cost to all development, which is ultimately passed on to the home buyer. The city must also consider how its compliance activities will support rather than threaten large city build building goals of achieving greater housing choice and affordability through infill. This includes taking an approach that makes more efficient use of the infill compliance team resources, enhances relationships between builders and neighbors, and incentivizes rather than penalizes compliant builders. The CHBA ER was pleased to see that the infill compliance team received fewer resident complaints in 2019 and witnessed more co compliance on site during inspections. This resulted in formal enforcement action decreasing by approximately 30% compared to 2018. We believe that this may be attributed to an increase in education and collaboration between the city and the residential construction industry, as well as the improved relationships between the neighbors and the builders. We are pleased to see an administration's response to the community stakeholder suggestions that the city is committed to working with the stakeholders to help neighbors better understand how to log their concerns to ensure accurate, relevant, and timely referrals to compliance teams. With builders as key stakeholders, the infill compliance team must work with the CHBA ER to explore opportunities to more effectively triage infill inquiries and concerns. This includes reinforcing the builder as the first point of contact for the neighbor and ensuring that neighbors are not only aware of the builder's responsibilities, but also acceptable construction practices. The value of building relationships between builders and neighbors cannot be understated, as this is often the first step to mitigating infill inquir inquiries and concerns. CHBA ER encourages our members to build relationships with neighbors during the construction process. Part of the relationship building process includes sharing information about the construction project, including its scope, scheduling and duration, the type of construction activities that the neighbors can anticipate and the builders contact information. We are hopeful that the builders can respond to and remedy construction related concerns quickly, giving the neighbor resolution. This will ensure that the infill compliance team is responding to valid inquiries of more serious nature as opposed to minor inconveniences. As it is noted in the report presented to you by administration today, the majority of infill projects are completed without negatively affecting adjacent properties. This cannot be understated. CHBA ER supports the development of the infill compliance team data dashboard. However, it must be supplemented with the additional data to accurately reflect the state of infill development. As administration develops the dashboard, it is crucial that the data on the number of valid complaints is reported and that the remedied complaints are documented. It is also important that the builders have the opportunity to remedy complaints before compliance data is published publicly. Finally, it is critical that data is included which reflects the number of infill projects that are built with no complaints. We need to celebrate infill success and ensure that this narrative is also shared. We recognize that the infill development requires shared trust, accountability, and mutual understanding of risk between the city and the residential construction industry. The CHBA, ER members want to continue to work in partnership with the city and to meet city building goals. Thank you, and I'm pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much for your presentation. And now we'll move on to uh, Scott Hayes from CHBA. Mr. Hayes. Uh, you must be muted. I cannot hear you. Cannot hear you yet. I would just recommend if Mr. Hayes uh, left the meet and rejoined, that that's usually a quick fix for this. Am I good now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. 
Sorry about that. I'm uh, I'm here to uh, support Don and Darby with questions only at this time. So just for questions okay. only. Okay. Correct. Okay, thank you. Then we will go on to uh, Kristen Merle from the Residential Infill Working Good uh, gr Working Group. Kristen. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. So thank you, Madam Chair, committee members, and council for the time today to share my experience living next to an infill. I bought my King Edward Park 1954 bungalow in the summer of 2014. I was looking for a community where you know your neighbors, yet have space to garden and create an outdoor sanctuary for myself and my daughter. The home next to me was a one and a half story build and the woman who lived there moved into the original build when she was a newlywed. When the time came for her to move out in late 2016, a for sale sign went up, a builder bought the property and the house came down. This is when the nightmare of a problem builder next door to me began. I want to clarify that I support and strongly agree with infill. I understand the need for higher density populations in older neighborhoods to support amenities and the cost of infrastructure. However, I don't believe this should be at the expense of their neighbors, both financially and mentally, as my experience has been. There are many examples of issues I had with the builder. I will focus on the two major issues first, then suggestions that I have for the city, and if time allows, share other concerning items. I also want to clarify that each time a new issue arose, I attempted to deal directly with the builder. First, they would make a promise that they never kept. Then they did not return my voicemails. And eventually there was not an option to leave voicemails on their contact number displayed on site. A significant frustration is the damage they caused to my fence. During demo, they broke a number of fence boards. When I spoke to the builder, they assured me that they would fix the fence when they did the landscape in the following spring. That never happened. I called throughout the following summer, and finally, they fixed the fence by screwing together the damaged boards with bits of other broken boards. When I shared with the builder that this was unacceptable, there was no response. The city told me that because the fence was on the property line, they do not get involved. I then sought mediation. When I asked the city for the builder's contact information for the mediation, I was told that they could not provide it. I had to pay a registry to complete a business search to get contact information for the builder that the city allowed to build next to me because they damaged my fence. I followed through with mediation and the builder never responded. My last option is to file a small claim against the builder, which would cost approximately $200 to file with the court and also the time, energy, and effort of being a single parent, working full time, now in a pandemic, suing a problematic builder that the city allowed to build next door to me. The other major con concern I have is with water drainage. The property was purchased to be rented out. The new homeowner has yet to clean the eaves troughs. This causes water to flow over and collect between our homes. I should mention that it is also now a two-story duplex that are four different units. The owner has told the renters to not give me their contact information. What I see is a problem builder now selling to a problem landlord. The city will not provide me the owner's contact information for me to request that they clean their eaves. I used to have a beautiful strip of garden and grass with stepping stones. The grass is now mud with no stones in sight. The city advised me there was nothing to be done as water technically is only falling onto the adjacent property. I would need to provide a video of water actually spilling onto my property for any action to take place. I'm now in a position of sourcing out quotes for yard work in the spring to try and, to try and avoid further water damage. What do I suggest? One, I would encourage the city to mandate upfront engagement between the builders and surrounding homeowners. Perhaps if there were relationships built at a kickoff, when issues do occur, that line of communication has already been established. Two, have a single point of contact 
that existing homeowners can call the city for any single build. I found it very frustrating and confusing calling 311 each time there was a new or existing issue. And three, I suggest you consider a rating system for buildings, and part of their assessment is community satisfaction. If they are a problematic builder, their rating reflects this, and their permitting costs are higher. Perhaps this would encourage them to be respectful builders, because how the system is currently set up, there's no accountability or repercussions for their problematic behavior. I will now thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate your presentation, and now we'll go to Sharon Bolton. Uh, good morning. I have never met Kirsten before today, but after hearing her story, I can see definite parallels with my experience. So many of the same incidents occurred, it was as if we were both dealing with the same builder. Let me tell you my story. I'm the owner-occupier of a home next door to an infill development, which was begun in the fall of 2018 and completed in 2019. Full disclosure, the builder developer was not a formal home builder, but he was the owner of the property who took on the job himself, hiring contractors when needed. I don't know if he completed the educational offerings the city has provided for builders, or if he was ignorant of the building codes and regulations, or simply willfully non-compliant. There were many transgressions involved in this infill project, including safety issues during excavation, damage to existing fence and landscaping, damage to city water infrastructure, resulting in the front street having to be dug up, and trespassing. I'm going to focus on the drainage issues that were the largest problem affecting my property. The infill was built very close to the property line and includes a high raised sidewalk, which takes up most of the side setback, leaving little room for drainage swell. In the summer of 2019, we realized that the builder had run his roof gutter eaves down through that raised sidewalk, exiting close to our foundation. This resulted in a large puddle down the side of our property, up against the foundation, every time there was a rainfall. We advised the builder that this was unacceptable, and he rectified the situation by adding a plastic elbow and poly tube to the outlet, directing it to the front of the property. Of course, the elbow was not sufficiently attached and got detached whenever there was a heavy rainfall. We then advised the builder that, due to lack of drainage swill, he would have to build a retaining wall. The so-called wall was built in September 2019, consisting of a line of construction brick, some with cutouts, and other similar cast-off materials that was not fastened down in any way. In other words, it was totally incapable of stopping and redirecting water runoff, but the builder seemed to think he had fulfilled his obligation. Spring melt in 2020 proved that his so-called retaining wall was totally inadequate, and I contacted 311 in April of 2020 to request an inspection. My formal witness statement, including photographs, was filed on May 2nd, and then nothing. Numerous follow-ups by email and telephone produced standard responses from 311, promises that someone would be in touch, but still no action. My frustration with the builder was now frustration with the city as I found that I was being totally stonewalled. To make matters worse, the monster rainstorm in July 2020 resulted in water in my finished basement. Remediation efforts ensued, and once we had the walls and floor down to concrete, it was apparent that the water was entering from the side of the property, right where the infill property was located. This was the first time in 25 years of owning this home that we had water leakage from this area, and there were no cracks in the foundation. Coincidence? I think not. We sealed from the inside and then asked the builder next door what he intended to do to fix the issue from his side. His answer was nothing, not my problem. The city approved my rough grading, so I don't have to do anything. So now his ineptitude is costing us money. In the meantime, the property sold in August. It took the involvement of my community league and my city councillor in late August to finally get a response from the drainage department. A senior drainage inspector attended September 22nd and agreed that the retaining wall was totally inadequate. The builder was finally made to replace it with a wall built according to code. Now the question on my mind and also posed by the inspector was, how did that ever get approved in the first place? The inspector did some research and found the answer. There had never been a final grading inspection as the builder had never applied for one. And yet there's deadlines for this to be done. The district falls and the home had been sold without final grading approval. Is that even allowed? 
So it's totally understandable that the frustration level is high for many neighbours of Enfield. As a neighbour of Enfield, I should not be forced to jump through hoops to protect my property. It should be the responsibility of the builder developer to ensure that his actions have no adverse effects. I also feel strongly that it's the responsibility of the city through inspection and enforcement to ensure that builders live up to their rep responsibilities. As Kirsten mentioned, you gave them that permit to build and implied in that permit are certain rules and obligations. With a push to more density and fewer regulations, apparent in zoning bylaw amendment initiative, there's a real concern that if these sorts of things are not resolved, there will be greater citizen pushback against the infill. There's a school of thought that perhaps the city is prioritizing quantity over quality. The city has the power to turn this around. Kirsten many, made many good suggestions for this, but I want to emphasize two things. Number one, please take Citizens 311 reports seriously. Number two, please have proper enforcement. There must be consequences for bad practices. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Appreciate those comments, Ms. Bolton. And now we'll go to Jim Fute. Hello. I'm here to ask you to consider changing the way the city goes about managing infill by allowing neighbors to somehow proactively insert information into the permit process to highlight special concerns with their property. I want to emphasize that I support new housing construction in Edmonton in principle. I've practically benefited from many of the new homes in our neighborhood uh, in terms of beauty, and I'm sure it's increased the value for my home. Hopefully I have an interesting view because my house has not yet suffered any damage. The damage is imminent and I just want to outline my struggles to avoid it. For some brief context, I have a house. It's uh, hundred and about, uh, about 105 years old. It's built with materials local to the neighborhood of Riverdale. Uh, back in the day when there was a brick factory along the riverbank. And our foundation is made from that old brick. It has no rebar, no cement. Uh, thus, it's now very delicate and requires the earth around it to remain stable. To complicate matters more, uh, due to mistakes made by surveyors more than a century ago, our house is exactly on the property line. So we moved into this old house. Uh, there was an empty lot beside us, and uh, the owner was the city. Since then, it's been sold, and there's been a sequence of three separate other private owners who've wanted to develop adjacent to our house. I want to begin with offering praise to the first private owner and builder. Uh, before applying for a development permit, uh, he personally uh, visited and inspected our property with an engineer, and it was their engineering report which first alerted me uh, to the particularly fragile condition of our foundation. That engineering report, as well as a sub subsequent engineering report uh, done last year, found uh, both of them that no excavation could be made within three meters of our property without dangerous risk to our foundation. Luckily for us, the owner was willing to adapt his house and his house plans and accommodate us uh, and accommodate this, this constraint in his building. Uh, unfortunately, that owner died and his estate sold the property. Since then, I've experienced um, no interactions with subsequent two owners or hostile interactions. And uh, this is the pattern. Uh, without any consultation with us, signs go up indicating intentions to build. We recognize their plans are, are going to be very close to us, always within three meters of our house. Uh, their excavation is going to be almost to the edge of their property, which essentially means exposing our fragile brick foundation, which we know is very likely to cause damage. Uh, we get very concerned. We alert the builder and offer him our engineering reports. The builders have always been 
accommodating and friendly at first, but when they understand that to protect our property from damage, either their plans are going to have to change, or at least their methods, uh, which will increase their costs undoubtedly, they understandably get upset at us. Then we receive threatening uh, letters from their lawyers. Uh, we've had denials that they have responsibility for our house. Uh, we've had suggestions or demands actually to move our house because it encroaches on their property. Uh, we've had demands to remove our eaves. Uh, we have have threats to sue for any increased costs or delays for them. And of course, we've approached the city and I've learned uh, over the years now that development permits, and I could be mistaken, so I could be corrected. But for me, I've, I've seemed to have learned for myself that development permits and building permits uh, don't focus on, or don't not even focus, uh, even account for uh, the na the condition of the neighbor's properties. So uh, what happens is builders are, I'm sure they bid on plans. Uh, they they go through a whole bunch of logistics, and then it comes. They put up the the uh, they put up their plans, and then we come along and say, well, hold on, uh, you know, worry about our house. They get upset and uh, try to um, they try I would say they're they're avoid yes they're trying to avoid their responsibilities but the I see the problem being the city has not um, no one has informed the builders I, I actually see them as major victims or uh, as victims of this process because ahead of time the information regarding our the conditions of our property uh, haven't been uh, given to them so that they can't make accommodations for it. And instead, they retroactively uh, need to change their plans. Thank uh, you, uh, therefore, Mr. I'm Sorry, you're out of time. I'm going to okay, have to get... That's fine. Uh, I've given all of my, uh, my major points. Thank you. Thank you. There could be questions for you later. Um, uh, the next speaker would be Suzanne Cherdorchuk. Hello. Sorry, there's a, there should be a, a presentation along with my speaking. Is it there? We're just Is it PowerPoint? It yes, we have it. We're just pulling it up. Okay. Um, well, just let me begin by saying that um, uh, I am actually not a part of the infill working group, but I am the neighbor of the case study, I guess, that you're, I'm about to present to you. Um, and so this has di directly affected me um, as friends and neighbors to these three properties. On April 17th, 7th of 2019, attempts were made to report an excavation failure and property damage to a 311 agent. And it was learned that the city cannot intervene in civil matters between neighbors and infill owners and builders, which was a surprise to the neighbor. Next slide, please. Uh, there was sloughing of the excavation walls also observed. Next slide. On April 8th, a 311 report is emailed documenting with photos multiple infractions in both the public and private realm. An urgent response is requested for a safety codes officer to investigate an excavation failure in progress. Occupational health and safety is notified who respond and issue an immediate stop work order. The builder is also notified. Next slide, please. April 9th, there's an email from the safety code officer that says, um, as a safety codes officer, I am responsible for enforcing the Alberta Building Code with respect to the building structure and the fencing on this property. I have already contacted the contractor regarding the gaps in the fencing. Next slide. April 15th, Occupational Health and Safety issues a second stop work order. And you can see that the fencing is no longer secure. Um, there is failure, the earth has fallen into, and the concrete of padding is sliding from the, the neighbors into that excavation. Next slide, please. April 15th, 
The safety code officer notes was informed that the site conditions had deteriorated. The whole north side of the north neighbor's property alongside his house is beginning to fail. A 30 foot high cedar tree is similarly leaning towards the excavation and this entire section of soil could fail completely at any moment. Next slide. April 16th, this is what the excavation failure and damage to adjacent property and building looked like. Next slide, please. On April 16th, Paul Chang, Provincial Building Administrator, responded to an email and explained, it is the City of Edmonton's jurisdiction to enforce their bylaws, including the Safety Codes Act. He forwards the highlighted excavation provisions from the Building Code. Next slide, please. On November 3rd, Another report states the city's enforcement of the act in relation to infill excavation is based on its interpretation that the code does not regulate construction excavation for infills beyond the property line. The outcome of this investigation does suggest the need for the city to revisit its position on excavations during infill construction to ensure that it includes all relevant sections of the code. Next slide, please. On April 16th, after the building code's excavation provisions are brought to his attention, the safety codes officer issues an order to immediately correct the stability of the open sides of the excavation on the construction site as per the Alberta Building Code, Division B, including Article 8.222. That states, if the ability of adjoining buildings may be endangered by the work of excavating, adequate underpinning, shoring, or bracing shall be provided to prevent damage to or movement of any part of the adjoining building. Next slide, please. Then April 19th, a neighbor emails his counselor. This is the neighbor to the south side of the infill property. It seems to me the city's laws aren't protecting the adjacent neighboring homes enough. With the depth of today's excavation, it leaves us with a situation where the contractor is trying to get the foundation in as quickly as possible, hoping that they'll backfill before damage occurs. They're left gambling with our homes. Next slide, please. April 23rd, the community representatives in response to this infill incident present recommendations to the Irving Planning Committee to improve the infill experience for neighbours and suggest the city apply and enforce the building code, resulting in a motion that administration work with community stakeholders to explore their suggestions. Next slide, please. Former Development Services Branch Manager David Hales in an email said, urgent, can you get me an update on this, please? I'd like to understand how they're dealing with the perch slab, which is extremely unsafe, and the restoration of the neighbor's property. I dropped by the site yesterday, and it's a disgrace. Next slide, please. The safety codes officer continues to inspect, but does not enforce the order. May 10th, the collapsed sidewalk is still in the same position as it was several weeks ago. No work has been done yet to address the sidewalk that was sliding into the excavation. June 3rd, the builder is blaming the neighbor for the delay. June 7th, the excavation still has yet to be backfilled. June 24th, the leaning sidewalk is still there. And next slide, please. Now in July 9th, you can see that the concrete slab is in the same place. The backfilling is still not done. And now after rain, there's accumulation of water in the excavation. Next slide, please. Thank you. Your time is up. Uh, Thank you. It'll be uh, followed up with the next presenter, I believe. She can take it from there. Right. Thank Thanks. you very much. And the next presenter I have is uh, Doug Cox. Good morning, Madam Chair, Council members, colleagues, and friends. As background, my name is Douglas Cox. I'm a retired civil engineer and uh, have been a resident of uh, Park Allen since 1997. Just as background, in order to set the stage for my thinking on this whole process of urban renewal uh, and related works, a few years ago, uh, Park Allen was subject to uh, some infrastructure renewal items, uh, namely surface, uh, surface works, uh, sidewalks and pavements, um, and uh, that undertaking went very, very well. It increased the service life of our curbs and gutters and sidewalks and streets and made them safer. It was aesthetically pleasing, uh, both to homeowners and so on. Uh, it certainly provided no risk to the homeowners. Uh, there was an increased cost, of course, but as a taxpayer, I'm quite prepared to pay for improvements. 
because that also, in addition to providing the increased safety and aesthetics, um, in, enhance the property values. I now um, make the opposing views as related to the infills, uh, which doesn't have an, a team of um, an engineering firm, a contractor, and the city involved. It just has a contractor and, and of course, the homeowners. The, the city seems to um, pull themselves out of that equation and shift the responsibility to others, and uh, neighbours have to learn the hard way uh, that they are relatively left on their own uh, own devices. Some of the risks and the major risks that are, are obviously apparent, at least to me, um, to the homeowner, and I'll list about four of them, although there are others, but these are the major ones that come to point immediately. Um, there's going to be an insurance uh, premiums related to claims from the infill development and the responsibility of those increased claims costs uh, certainly fall completely with the homeowner. Secondly, if the homeowner adjacent wishes to undertake uh, and involve legal, then those costs are clearly are the responsibility of the homeowner. The next two include the uh, sanitary system. And I mentioned that the, the infrastructure works uh, did uh, great improvements to the surface um, items, but the sanitary system as well as the storm system may not accommodate the increased volumes as a result of the increased population density. And so the sanitary system, I believe in my street, is on the order of 60 to 70 years old. So the jury is still out whether in fact that system will accommodate the increased flows. The fourth item with respect to risks is that um, my Park Allen asset um, is going to be depreciated at an accelerated rate. And the value of that asset will be reduced really to the value of the land to the developer. My home still has uh, many years of life left in it, but if development occurs to the percentage of 50%, I think my asset is going to be decreased. The jury's still out, but those are inherent risks that, if not currently present, will become more evident as time goes on. I, I did have uh, an infill project which uh, was constructed immediately adjacent to my home. Um, that actually went reasonably well. Uh, I made a point of uh, establishing dialogue with the contractor right from the onset. Um, I asked about the depth of the excavation, where the footprint of the home was going to be in order to do some quick uh, sketchy calculations to um, come to understanding on my part whether in fact my foundation was under um, jeopardy or whether it was going to lack any integrity. And um, But not all homeowners have that necessary background uh, from an engineering perspective in order to be able to make those quick assessments. And they find out too late perhaps that engineering involvement might have been been needed. But again, that cost would be borne by themselves. The issues that I had with the contractor are, are really um, band-aid sorts of things, um, lots of debris, and all the other issues associated with construction adjacent. But those are relatively minor and they go away with time. And it's just the bigger difficulties and the increased costs and risks that, that neighbors have to deal with. Only once did I contact the city by dialing 311, and that experience was very disappointing. It took days to hear back, and then no action was undertaken. So allow me to conclude by just saying that the, the city, in my view, to a large degree, um, hides behind rules, and they've advocated their responsibility to deal with issues uh, during development to a large extent. And they certainly have transformed, transferred all kinds of obvious and inherent risks to neighbors of infill. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions, I would be pleased to accommodate them to the best of my ability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cox. Now we'll go to Jan Hardstaff. I don't know how long that took. Right. Thank you for allowing me to speak this morning. Um, I, first of all, want to just finish telling the story that Suzanne started. Um, that story ended that in October 11th, almost six months later, after the initial excavation failure and the uh, safety code officer's order, um, 
nothing was enforced. It was vacated when the house was completed, uh, when framing was completed and the foundation was backfilled. And there really wasn't compliance. It just was that that milestone in the project had been reached. Um, it also resulted in the neighbor selling his home the following year. He suffered extreme stress, ex anxiety, uncertainty. It really ruined him. And he grew up in that home and inherited it. And he had to move. So that is a terrible outcome for everyone. Nobody wins. The city doesn't win. The builder doesn't win. The neighbor doesn't win. The community doesn't win. You know, infill, the, the, the reputation of infill doesn't win. This should just not be allowed to happen. So now I'll begin with what I was going to say. Um, the results provided in attachment five of the report outline the city's actions uh, that we believe will have the effect of rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Why? Because nothing has changed about the city's policy related to enforcement of the building code. Scripting changes to 311 may, may result in more referrals to safety codes and lot grading, but if they don't change how they apply the law, nothing changes. It is our understanding that 311 agents will continue to tell neighbors who call to report private property damage. The city cannot intervene in civil matters between them and infill owners and builders. This leaves the neighbor holding the bag. We have researched and provided to you our Appendix A building code basics. The building code is an enforcement regime. It's not an educational system. It is an objective and risk-based model for use to protect the safety of the public and adjacent buildings throughout an infill project. The building code reflects society's expectations that construction activities will not create the risk of harm to people or damaged property. The city is accredited to enforce and apply the building code. The public must be informed that safety codes officers currently limit the scope of their application and enforcement of the code to the building structure and fencing. This limited scope of application and enforcement falls short of the objectives to protect adjacent buildings and facilities from structural damage including from excavation failure. In a November 3rd, 2017 letter from the Provincial Accreditation Administrator, the city was advised uh, that they must apply the building code in, in its entirety and that um, the excavation provisions of the building code are, are not being enforced and this exposes, exposes neighbors of infill to risk of impact and potential damage. FOIP records show builders appreciate the city's educational approach to enforcement. This is because it allows them to maintain projects scheduling and reduce overall costs. However, educational enforcement is not a substitute for builder compliance with the law and safety code officer enforcement of the law when compliance is not forthcoming. This is not optional. It, is, it appears otherwise, and there is no substantial consequence for non-compliance then incentives to comply and, private, uh, and, and protect private property are removed. Prior to 2019, complaints of private property damage were refused by 311. The city collected no doubt about the number, type, or severity of, of this type of damage resulting from infill construction, and so the complaints were unknown. This is why the Residential Infill Working Group did the 2020 Neighbors of Infill Survey. That attachment three shows data up from the safety codes and lot grading officers and you will see there's no enforcement for safety codes. And there's only one ticket issued by lot grading officers. That is unacceptable. We know that there's more damage than that. Administration is recommending to council to transition to the presentation of data to the public on a data dashboard and to provide an annual memo to council that will not be made public. This should not be done. RIWG believes public reporting is critical to maintain public transparency and accountability especially given ongoing unresolved concerns and ongoing evidence of infill-related impacts and damage. The city's been telling the public the infill compliance team monitors infill sites, but they do not make it clear that, the, that they only have authority to do so on the infill site and in the public realm. What is positive infill? The city developed the Everyone's Edmonton campaign in 2016, defining two options. One can be for infill or against infill. There is a concerted effort to rebrand infill as positive and normalize infill redevelopment as no different than greenfill development. But this isn't about semantics or ideology. It is about ensuring the interests of all stakeholders are balanced. Currently, things are heavily weighted toward industry and the city plan for future growth. But what is missing is the necessary risk mitigation and damage prevention plan that will protect the public. And what's missing in city policy is consistent application and enforcement of the law. 
the Thank pace you. of infill development is about to dramatically increase with the city plan. Thank the city plan states much. it is an invitation to build a version of our city that respects and preserves the things we value today while creating a city to attract the next million residents. Jan, residents your time is up. Sorry. Am I Thank done? You. you were working hard at it, but your time's up. Appreciate okay. that. Uh, we are going to go to Diane Dennis, please. Okay, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I'm just uh, presenting uh, survey findings that of a survey the Residential Infill Working Group carried out in 2020. Um, I think it was April to September, end of August, something like that. So we conducted this survey to get a more in-depth understanding of the types and frequency of damage and impacts experienced by neighbors of construction. The survey also asked re respondents for recommendations to improve infill experience of neighbors. The survey was done as a follow-up to the city's 2016 survey because the city has not been consistently collecting the, the, this kind of information. And 311 operators have been instructed not to create files for most complaints regarding private property damages because it's a civil matter, as noted before. To conduct the survey, we distributed an online survey link to mature neighborhoods through some community league communications and the Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues e-news. E survey was completed by 175 people from 41 mature neighborhoods and included fixed and response and open-ended questions. So I'm brief, pre presenting a brief summary of the results. When asked if construction activities caused damage or had other impacts on their property, including buildings on their property, 79% of the survey respondents indicated they did, they did have damages to their property or other negative impacts. Damages were largely caused by demolition and excavation activity, trespassing and drainage problems. The, the demolition and excavation phase of construction was the most damaging and hazardous. So then some notable items from the survey reported demolition, excavation risks and damages. 47% reported vibrations during demolition, which often led to cracks in the walls of their homes, broken windows, seals or falling objects. 26% reported excavations on or beyond the property line, which caused soil movement on their property creating high risk of damage. 30% reported soil movement from their property toward excavation, which affected fencing by 30%, landscaping 22%, and sidewalks 9%. Note, soil movement inside yards may, be, may indicate that the neighbor's home is also at risk of structural damages. 26% reported damages to their home. 26% also said new cracks in the interior or exterior of their home. 13% had structural damages, floors were no longer level, doors or windows stuck, and 3% reported foundations were exposed and their homes tilted towards the excavation. So tilting of buildings indicates major structural damage, which is not likely repairable. And then finally, 40% reported excavations not being entirely enclosed by secure fencing, causing safety hazards. In terms of trespassing, 40% reported damage and loss of security from trespassing workers, as well as equipment and construction fencing placed on their property. Fences, trees, other landscaping, and driveways were often damaged during trespassing, and sometimes utilities were stolen. stolen. That is, construction workers were using electricity or water from neighbors' properties. Finally, uh, D drainage problems. 30% of respondents with completed construction next door reported flooding by stormwater draining from the infill site. So then just to look at the estimated number of excavation failures per year, we went to city the dashboard and, and we looked at uh, 2019 building permits City issued 580 infill construction permits, 29 or 5% of those projects reported excavation failures. If each of these sites had two adjacent sites, 58 adjacent neighbors could have experienced damage from infill excavations. That's a pretty poor record when the city has aspirations of doubling its population largely through infill. The findings from our survey are within that 5% range of administration data, showing that 3% experienced serious structural damage, 
i.e. the foundation exposed, and conservatively, at least 13% of respondents had other structural damage to their homes from excavation failures. Finally, in terms of response, city, um, according to survey respondents, the city and builders were, were, for the most part, unresponsive to requests for assistance in resolving concerns such as property damage. Only 16% had damages or other problems resolved by the builder satisfactorily, while only 7% said city this, they were able to resolve um, the issues through city or OHS in, intervention. And then overall, just a general satisfaction question, only 14% of our survey respondents were satisfied with the res resolution of the issues. Thank the you burden very was placed much. on the neighbors to resolve the problems. Neighbors spent money, time, Thank and emotional energy on attempts to fix damage and other problems created by the construction activity. Thank you. Your time is, is up. Thank you. Did I finish? Uh, no, <laughs> no okay. sorry. Uh, your time is four up. recommendations. Improve inspections, enforcement, ensure city policies and laws protect neighbors of construction, provide supports to neighbors for addressing issues that arise, and establish higher standards and monitor builders. That's it. Thank you. And now we'll go to Bev Zubat. Thank you. Um, the survey obviously shows that damage to neighbors' property is common. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that way. We have laws to protect adjacent private and property, public property. The public needs enforcement of the building code to prevent and mitigate excavation failures, for instance. And the building code also mandates that the builder comply with local laws about lot grading and drainage. This is the drainage bylaw. Non-enforcement of the building code is at the root of most problems. So how are we doing with the enforcement of the building code? Well, if you look at admin's report, page 14, table five, you get a glimpse into the enforcement of the building code by safety codes officers, but it doesn't provide the full picture uh, with FOIP documents and the table five in attachment three of admin report. Uh, we know that in 2019, there were 28 excavation complaints, 13 infractions found by safety codes officers, and seven safety code act orders issued. We know that there were no penalties, no penalties. We don't know uh, the extent to which the orders were even enforced. That information isn't available. Um, but what we do know, there were a couple of cases where there were, they had to uh, issue the orders several times. But again, there's no evidence that there, was, there were any penalties. So there does not appear to be strong prompt enforcement, that's for sure. And if failing excavations are not stabilized, the risk to adjacent property increases and the failing excavation could cause major structural damage to adjacent buildings. So it's so important for regulatory agencies to intervene and ensure the excavation is stabilized before damages become irreparable. So over the years, I've heard many stories about uh, excavation failures and horrible consequences for the neighbor. But there comes a point when these people, the worst victims, are silenced, and for a number of reasons. Some are silenced by trauma. It is too painful to recount the experience. One survey respondent wrote, I can say that I still have PTSD after my experience. Filling out the survey was the absolute most she thought she could do. She could not speak publicly and stay calm. Uh, nor have we heard from the, person, the property owner of the Park Allen incident. Um, he did not want to fill out the survey. He's trying to put the experience behind him. Then there are some who are silenced by an ongoing lawsuit or a settlement agreement. We won't hear from them either. Others are silenced by the fear of losing their job with the city or the building industry. 
one person agreed to complete the questionnaire only if we guaranteed total anonymity. Others are too stressed and busy trying to put their life in order again after being forced to move or rebuild because their home was no longer considered habitable and no longer insurable. People have taken a serious financial loss because they are unable to prove that the excavation failure caused the foundation damage or the insurance company will only pay for the cost of replacing the foundation, not the whole house. Then there's some people who've just given up because they have not been compensated for damages and do not have the resources to move or rebuild. So they live in their damaged home. One person talked about having constant mouse infestation due to the cracks in the foundation, but she was unable to sell her now uh, tear down home uh, and afford to live anywhere else. Um, one young homeowner wrote, our house tilted towards the excavation. The floor is not level and our doors and windows don't work properly. When our house shifted, it created a gap between our house and brick sidewalk and our sidewalk collapsed along that side. We were told we had <clears throat> no way to prove that the damage was caused by construction <clears throat> and, not, and not by dry conditions like my dry throat. <clears> throat> um, <clears throat> sorry about that. <clears throat> And then there are the people who are fatigued. In addition to having to figure out how to repair their home damaged by an excavation failure, there are multiple problems which seem endless. They just quit complaining to the city because the, only, the city may listen, but nothing is done. One survey respondent wrote, this experience has been an absolute nightmare. I've become so exhausted by it that I have largely given up on it ever being resolved and have considered moving I'm supportive of the idea of infill, but nightmare projects like this are why so many citizens are opposing it infill in my community. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll go to uh, Mr. Stephen Poole. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my topic today is uh, the Infill Compliance Team Annual Report 2019, Attachment 6. At the April 23rd, 2019 Urban Planning Committee meeting, the administration received the following motion. Explore options to introduce an excavation inspection and approval process on infill projects. Administration did not fulfill this motion. No options for action by administration are explored. They instead present an incomplete and idealized version of the facts that is mostly irrelevant to the motion to distract and to divert readers. The transfer of unacceptable risk of property damage to neighbors of infill arising from excavation for infill construction continues to be the deliberate policy and consistent practice of administration. Administration writes, it is important to note that the National Building Code Alberta edition does not regulate excavations. In fact, the NBC AE contains provisions that regulate excavations and provisions to prevent damage to both public and private property. These apply to all construction sites at every stage of construction. And I'll give some uh, somewhat truncated quotes from the code. Um, I've removed some of the wording for brevity, but not changed the context. An objective of this code is to limit the probability that adjacent buildings or facilities will be exposed to an unacceptable risk of structural damage. The risks are those caused by settlement of the medium supporting adjacent buildings or facilities and collapse of the excavation. It also says excavations shall be kept reasonably clear of water. And there's an intent statement attached to that. The intent is to limit the probability that water will lead to the excavation collapsing, which could lead to harm to persons. That's clause 8221. And one that we've already touched on, 
if the stability of adjoining buildings may be endangered, may be endangered, doesn't say there has to be imminent. It says if it may be endangered by the work of excavating, then adequate underpinning, shoring and bracing shall be provided to prevent a damage to or movement of any part of the adjoining building and the creation of a hazard to the public. The intents here are to limit the probability that excavation operations will lead to damage to adjacent buildings and to limit the probability that excavation operations will lead to the failure of any part of adjoining buildings which could lead to harm to persons. And that's 8222 that's already been touched on. Despite the above denial, administration is actually fully aware of this content. A FOIP email of April 17, 2019, from uh, Chad Rich to Jason Savixe states, the Alberta Building Code regulates some construction aspects of excavation activities, including the design and the support of an excavation where applicable. Attachment 6 also states, the building code requires that shoring be designed by a professional engineer when considered applicable to the construction activities. And it goes on to state, safety codes officers are not professional engineers and would not be able to assess when protection may be required and if so, the design or installation of said protection. Now, a safety codes officer familiar with home building is in fact capable of recognising a potentially unstable excavation. And that's all he has to do. He doesn't have to design a protective structure. And he's certainly able to recognise one that's beginning to fail with slumping soil, growing surface cracks, leaning fences, or trees, and other obvious features. The deliberate policy and consistent practice of safety codes is to completely ignore these clear indicators and to allow the unacceptable risk to adjacent property to occur and then to develop and cause damage. This is a building code violation. Safety codes consistently does not enforce the code. Administration plays down damage incidents as a small percentage of projects and avoids, avoids dis discussion of the extreme life-changing severity of some incidents. Thank In you, fact, Mr. Paul. Thank you. Your time's up. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll go to Cassandra Haraba. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. <laughs> okay. Um, would the city clerk please bring up my first slide? Uh, my name is Cassandra Haraba. I've been working with the Residential Infill Working Group on a single issue over the past uh, number of years, solely in the public interest, and that is proper enforcement of the building code to prevent and remedy property damage from infill construction excavation failures. This is not best practices. This is not a civil matter. This is the law. Currently, we have about 29, 29 of these a year by estimation, and I think we've agreed on that number. If you double the pace of infill, then you risk doubling that number, and it's already pretty big. So all I really have time to do today is remind you about who's in charge here. Who is responsible for enforcing the law when the medium could or does settle in an excavation beside an adjacent home? Here's my first slide. It says who's in charge here, and you will notice that at the top, we have the public. And at the bottom, we have the builders. The safety code system is solely to protect the public and the builders are the regulated group that the safety code system regulates to protect the public. In between, we have the regulatory system for that regulated group. First, the legislature passes the building code to regulate builders to protect the public's safety and property. Second, the, the law makes the Minister of Municipal Affairs responsible for the entire system and delegates that delegates the responsibility for implementing the law to the Safety Codes Council. And under the Safety Codes Council, actually in the Safety Codes Council, we have two administrators, one for municipal accreditation, and they accredit city, the City of Edmonton. And they are above City Council. And on the other side, on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see the Administrator of Officer Certification, who is responsible 
for the provincial certification of the provincial safety codes officers. And those are, you'll go back to the left side of the screen, you'll see city council hires the city manager, the sole employee, who hires the safety codes officers, who are provincial employees who the, the city has the privilege of embedding in the administration, in the administrative structure of the municipality for, for um, ease of enforcement, shall we say. This is not necessary, it's not, the, it's not a right, it's a privilege and it can be replaced by other schemes. Underneath all of that again is the builder. So you know, ultimately what we, what we see here is that uh, this is an enforcement re regime, this is not an educational regime. Officers must regulate builders in accordance with the law. When this chain of command gets broken, when it gets reversed, it's time to hit the reset button. And that's where we are today. One way or another, this reset must occur. Would the city clerk bring up my second slide? I'm going to speak now about our motion that we've presented to the city council in our report and a subsequent email. Now this motion is fair, this motion is targeted this motion cuts red tape. We're not asking to take the entire accreditation away from the city. We're only asking to remove certain aspects of the accreditation for certain reasons that will be more in the public interest. The red tape we're cutting, one of those pieces of red tape would be all of this back and forth using public resources between city council, public administration to no avail that we've been undertaking for the last six years. And I'll just uh, read out the motion to you that city council pass a resolution to apply to the safety codes council to amend Ad Edmonton's quality management plan that's required by the law. The safety codes act requires that to relinquish the power to enforce the residential infill construction excavation provisions of the building code, pass the power to an external agency to impartially and fully enforce those provisions in Edmonton. That's very possible and the city's done that in other aspects of safety codes in the past. And engage the Minister of Municipal Affairs to oversee enforcement of those provisions in Edmonton and to conduct a third party audit of Edmonton's administration of the Safety Codes Act and regulations. And that is because in that chain of command, when it comes to the person at the top of the food chain, it is the minister, and we are at the point where we need to involve the minister in, uh, in taking a close look at how this is working, even if we do pass the enforcement to another agency, we need to make sure that we're actually resolving the serious problem that we've been working on for six years, and we've been in front of council now five times about. Subject to your questions, those are my submissions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we'll go to Stephanie Kovach. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today on behalf of VOCL. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry about that. I'm here to talk about Action 9 of the Infill Roadmap, which explicitly addresses the need to better inform residents on how they can effectively participate in the planning process, and therefore stresses the importance of communication and the sharing of timely information with nearby residents of redevelopment projects. Before I begin, I would like to preface my presentation by saying that there exists no proposal before you to eliminate any of the current methods of information sharing with neighbors, which is great. <laughs> However, because Action 9 is now listed as complete in the infill roadmap and there are other conversations happening regarding notification of the city, we felt this was an appropriate, appropriate opportunity to convey how important current methods of information sharing are for neighbors. Over the course of the last several years, the EFCL has welcomed opportunities to engage with members of the Infill Liaison Team and has participated in many productive conversations with this group. Together, we have discussed and solutioned issues flagged by community leagues related to Infill, with a large part of our feedback being around gaps in communication, residents feeling like they don't have the necessary information to participate, and potential approaches to remedy these concerns. The team has been very responsive in working with us and developing resources to help bridge this gap, including creating the Housing Redevelopment What to Expect brochure, which consolidates the information previously available in the Neighbors of Infill brochure and checklist. This brochure is sent with Class A development permit notifications and proactively addresses many of the most common questions and concerns from community members when properties undergo redevelopment in their neighborhoods, including 
the contact information and responsibilities of the builder and what they are supposed to do to limit impacts on neighboring properties and the public realm, the contact information for the city, including 311 prompts and phrases that neighbors can use to report a problem and hopefully ensure it gets routed to the right team for resolution, guidance for neighbors on how to protect themselves and their assets, including guidance on documenting the current condition of their property, information on city websites where more information can be obtained, and information related to the various departments and external agencies responsible for a wide variety of issues related to infill and how to get in touch with them. All of this amounts to a wealth of information that is consolidated into a concise and easy to read package that is proactively delivered to residents before construction ever begins. This allows citizens to familiarize themselves with the land redevelopment process, understand how to access the resources available to them from the outset, and become aware of potential avenues of recourse in the unfortunate event that something goes wrong. However, at the Tuesday, October 27th, Urban Planning Committee committee meeting when the zoning bylaw omnibus was discussed, there was a proposal to eliminate Class A development permit notifications. While a motion was made to have this particular amendment removed from the omnibus, there was discussion that it will still be considered in the upcoming renewal project. While we understand that alternative avenues for notification will be explored through the renewal, in the event that Class A permit notifications are discontinued, it is our understanding that the housing redevelopment brochure would no longer be mailed to residents and would only be available online. While the new city website related to neighborhood redevelopment is much more useful than previous web pages, and accessing this information online may be feasible for many, only providing this information in a digital format will preclude a significant number of households from obtaining the information in a timely manner, either because they don't have access or because they just don't know where to look. Beyond that, it also puts the onus on existing residents to seek out the resources available to them, which we really feel like is a step backwards. These resources were developed to provide clarity on redevelopment and to pr improve communication with the public. Again, Action 9 of the Infill Roadmap acknowledges there is a need to better inform residents on how they can effectively participate, and this work should be ongoing. While the current materials could be improved further, we are concerned by checking this action as complete, and with adjacent work related to notifications happening elsewhere, it will have a knock-on effect of reducing awareness for existing residents on what to expect during redevelopment. Again, we know current methods of communication will exist as is for the time being, and we welcome opportunities to work to improve them, but we hope that, we'll keep, that we hope you'll keep this information in mind as other projects unfold in the coming year, and that the educational materials specifically related to infill will still be made available via mail before construction begins, regardless of the fate of Class A permit notifications. That's all from me. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. And uh, now we'll go to Ryan Edick. Hello, Madam Chair and uh, members of the committee. Um, my name is Ryan Eidick. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm an urban planner with Enhanced Consulting, but I'm here representing one of the seven projects that was funded for the infill fire protection cost share program. Um, the program funded a, uh, a new hydrant and a small amount of water infrastructure upgrades that were required to support a missing middle development, so a four-story apartment building in Garno. Um, Funding for this program is, is very key and it, it is difficult to get and it doesn't necessarily guarantee the project's success. And that's what I want to talk about today. So um, to illustrate that our project in Garneau that got funding um, is actually still navigating through the development permit phase. Um, so the hydrant and the water infrastructure upgrades were uh, designed and installed over the summer. Uh, we're still dealing with um, getting our development permit and that type of thing. So the water infrastructure um, cost share program is very important but it is just one of the hurdles. Like we've heard from a lot of the speakers today, infill's complicated, especially for missing middle. Um, so the, the, the water infrastructure is just what, just one of those hurdles, excuse me. Uh, one of the bigger issues is timing. So um, a lot of these infrastructure upgrade requirements come at either rezoning phases or at pre-application meeting phases, um, which kills a lot of projects. So in a lot of circumstances, um, especially at rezoning phases, um, not a lot of the final design is done or at least done to a point where EPCOR is able to give a firm number 
on how much is going to be required and how much that's going to cost. So to illustrate that, when our project in Garno got um, that got funded, when we sat down at our pre-application meeting with the city and with EPCOR, we were given a range of funding, or uh, sorry, a range of infrastructure upgrades required of fifty thousand dollars up to three hundred thousand dollars, and that's fair enough because not a lot of uh, we didn't provide any final design. We just wanted to know what what that infrastructure upgrade would look like, and we were given that range. Now that range is uh, a fairly large sticker shock and kills a lot of projects right there in its in its tracks because it's difficult to budget for something of that magnitude and at least move projects to a detailed design phase that you would get that um, that number narrowed a little bit so having funding available definitely helps at least to get projects over that initial hump and that uh, and get past that initial sticker shock and into the detailed design. So I definitely support the city's and EPCOR's efforts um, and, and the ask to expand the program to have more funding and a larger scope of projects available to, for funding um, uh, through the next round. But uh, I also applied for two other projects uh, through this program and both were denied as a result of um, uh, the narrow scope. So they weren't at a degree of readiness, nor were they um, close enough to some transit avenues and that type of thing. So it's a very difficult thing to achieve to get this funding. And I definitely support the city's efforts in, uh, in asking for more scope and more funding. So I just want to conclude by saying thank you to the city and to EPCOR for this pilot program. The project in Garno definitely would not have even made it to this stage um, had it not been for that program and, and receiving the funding, even though it was one of the smaller amounts of funding that was received, um, especially for missing middle projects, it, it definitely helps. So I do support the ask for additional funding and for a wider scope of projects that could be funded because I think at, at very minimum, it can get some of these projects, especially for the missing middle, um, beyond that initial hump and into the detailed design phase. And then hopefully we can um, get some more of them realized like it is indicated in the city plan. So I'll, I'm here to answer questions and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and our final speaker of this panel will be Mariah Samji. Good morning, Urban Planning Committee and to the rest of council here today. Over the past few months, I have spent time reading and talking with others about Edmonton's economy and how we move forward during and after this pandemic. Over the past many years, Council in Edmonton has had the foresight to look at diversifying, diversifying our housing stock, even before starting the infill roadmap 1.0, creating efficiencies in our transit and mobility options through ETS, uh, scooters, creating parking programs, and this will only become more efficient with smart fares a focus on our businesses and arts programs through programs like the Client Liaison Team and the many festivals will support our city as we grow. However, now our city is at a juncture where we need to focus time and resources on creating fair and predictable processes to increase Edmonton's ability to be more efficient with our land use and our resources through an infrastructure review and funding programs. The pipes, poles and asbestos are leading to increased prices in our mature and core areas where we have sufficient land to redevelop and we have businesses, buses, and schools looking for more people. Today, I wanna to focus on the cost share program. I can't state enough how proud I am that EPCOR, the city of Edmonton, CHBA, and IDEA came together quickly to find solutions to big problems with limited data and information. Seven projects moved forward, 112 more units came, are, are coming to Edmonton. But each of those costs came to about $20,000 per door, which would have otherwise killed those projects. I would like to say that we're done. We did it. The program is solved. The pipes are perfect. But we're not there yet. We need this program to become permanent. 27 projects didn't get selected. 2,388 units didn't get chosen. Some of this is because they weren't aligned with the criteria that was focused on missing middle transit-oriented development. But mostly the projects didn't get chosen because of a limited budget. For the pilot. Our infill entrepreneurs who are employing people, diversifying our housing stock, and increasing Edmonton's efficient land use can't pay $330,000 per project to build these projects. They can't get investors for that cost, and they can't pass that cost on to consumers. When discussing the new performance-based rates in February, we ask that you please fund this program with a minimum of $20 million over the next five years. This program will help us to achieve our city plan goals and increase economic growth within Edmonton. I do also wanna to speak to the construction practices that are being discussed today. It is positive to see that residents' complaints 
have decreased by 22%. And the City of Edmonton and outside organizations have been working to increase knowledge over the past decade. We're happy to see that proactive inspections have also increased by 45%. This is the launch of our expedited infill program with the City of Edmonton, which covers five topics, design, building permits, development permits, best, practice, best construction practices, and community relations. We have held three rounds and certified 40 companies. We also had the compliance team at speak at our last round. The pilot also has a demerit system, which, is atta which was attached to specifically uh, point at problems that were happening within Edmonton around construction issues and permit applications. The building practices were, were chose based on uh, previous behaviors within Edmonton. Since the start of the pilot, zero demerits have been given to those who have gone through the program. Overall, we see that proven through data, education with a carrot approach can achieve the desired outcome of reducing compliance issues. Data is key in this conversation. We have seen that education and work that the city of Edmonton has undertaken over the past multiple years at, and continues to implement, implement decreases complaints and issues throughout Edmonton. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. At this point, we are now going to open up the boards and we're going to uh, invite folks to ask questions of any of the panelists. And I see we'll begin with uh, Councillor Banga. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks to everyone for coming out today and uh, expressing your year uh, nay or uh, support, non-support towards uh, different aspects of the of uh, infill. And uh, uh, I'm going to start with uh, uh, Miss Hardstaff and. Uh, and maybe somebody else can pitch it too uh, from the RWID. Uh, the question is, uh, here we are talking about um, or sort of balance uh, the act of uh, advancing city goals uh, and towards infill. And then it also has to be sort of uh, proportionally balanced uh, for the viability of the project. And then on the other hand, it's uh, damage to the neighboring property, city's in ability or inability to enforce. And then comes uh, building co uh, cost and uh, I guess irresponsible behaviors by the builder, developer, whatever you want to call it. Uh, is it even possible to attain all those? I mean, even with the increased uh, I guess a uh, number of uh, extra enforcement techniques, bylaws, or whatever. Uh, well, first of all, the city plan states, uh, and I was just finishing that in my presentation, and I said it, it states, it is an invitation to build a version of our city that respects and preserves the things we value today while, while creating a city to attract the next million residents. And I wanted to say, go on to say, residents of mature neighborhoods want to live in a place that feels like home and feels safe and secure. In September, uh, on September the 13th, uh, we presented a couple of amendments to the city plan to essentially add that to the city plan to ensure that, that, that everyone benefits from infill. And that means that everyone should have a positive infill experience they should have a positive infill story to tell. This is what we're trying to get across the city council and why we feel that the enforcement of the law consistently in its entirety is critical. Because if we don't do that, educational enforcement approach has sort of a tendency to uh, have builders feel that, well, maybe they'll just be warned or there's, there's not really an incentive to protect adjacent property. We don't want to, uh, we're not against infill, and we understand that builders have a challenging uh, job on their hands to build infill in, in next to existing development. Uh, it's a completely different game than building greenfield uh, development, but there needs to be a plan in place, a risk mitigation plan in place that the city uh, works out with all stakeholders to ensure that private property and public property is protected. And while I understand that the city plan, ha they're, they're, 
there, there, there's fewer complaints this year. Those are only complaints about the public realm. Those are only complaints that the infill compliance team is authorized to enforce. That is the development compliance officers enforcing zoning and the um, uh, community standards peace officers are enforcing municipal bylaws in the public realm. What we're talking about is private property damage. And there, and as we showed in attachment three, there's very, there's no enforcement. There's, there's orders issued and no enforcement. One ticket only for a lot grading. If, if the city wants to uh, double the pace of infill development going forward uh, with the city plan, and I also know that, that they're in the zoning bylaw renewal, I've read all the discussion papers, and the residential zone discussion paper indicates that, that uh, development intensity will increase dramatically. They will, you will start to see up to 40% site increase if we're allowed to, if, you're, if builders are allowed to build the site coverage that is currently allowed in developing areas and the mature neighborhood overlays eliminate it. So we're trying to get ahead of that. We think that impact could increase and that this is going to become a worse problem. We think that now is the time for the city to get a risk mitigation plan in place and start enforcing the law. Okay. Uh Madam Chair, I don't know what happened to my time, but uh, I am not sure either. I guess I took it all. Sorry. <laughs> Madam Clerk, does Councillor Bank have any time left? Uh, maybe a, a minute or two, but the, the timer did glitch. So you have another minute or two, that's it. And okay. it is back up. All right, I'll see. And uh, basically my question is the same for... Uh, uh, Mr. Graham and uh, Ms. Samji and uh, and others uh, on that line of uh, thought. Uh, even in uh, the infill builders, uh, uh, I know they they're only going to proceed with uh, if they're making a dollar. Could you be able to comment on uh, mm -hmm. if uh, and, and those people are? are uh, making even a bit of money, I'm not saying they, they're lying in their pockets and whatnot, is it fair to the taxpayers to inject that money into, into somebody's pockets, from, some, from the taxpayer's pocket to a developer's pocket? How fair is that? Um. Hi, it's Mick Graham. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what your question is. Um, uh, okay. On, uh, the on, the, on the liability piece, um, uh, I think there probably is a role to play for uh, the city to intervene when builders are behaving irresponsibly. Um, I, you know, on all my projects, introduce myself to the neighbors if they're not home. I have a little door hanger that I leave with them with my contact information. Um, candidly, um, I lose, there's damage to about half the fences that flank the properties where I build. Um, I always have money in the budget to repair them and I always do so. Um, I, I, I would caution council uh, to look at the data and not the anecdotes, um, whereas, where I don't dismiss these things as, as being valid problems, I think the trend is positive uh, based on what we've seen over the last couple or three years. IDEA is certainly doing what we can to up the level of, of construction best practices uh, in our group, and I, I would be happy to... Um, to offer an invitation to the residential infill working group to uh, to meet with IDEA and, and see if we can take a run at these problems. Okay, thank you. Ms. Samji, I will come back to you in the second round. You know my question now. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Banga. Now I'm going to Councillor Henderson. Um, yeah, I, and I'm not quite sure where to start. I had a few questions, and some of it's based on the information that, that was sent out to us. Um, in terms of the building code, uh, I, I'm interested in this uh, 
there's there's mention in, in some of it about building and facility or facility. And I you know I think this has been the 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 issue all the way along. I don't think there's ever been a debate that uh, the neighboring buildings need to be protected. Um, what that looks like and what kind of other things um, can happen in terms of fences or or sidewalks or collapse of ground. Um, you know, I, the, I couldn't find a definition in what in, in, in the information you sent us of facility, and I'm wondering if you can speak to that a bit. May I speak to that? It's Cassandra. Yeah, that's sorry. That was my question was to you. Sorry, my apologies. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. Okay, um, I was just butting in. So, uh, two things. One, settlement of the medium is the issue here. So, if you're seeing fences and sidewalks moving, you've got settlement of the medium, and that already triggers the risk to the na to the adjacent property. Okay. The definition of facility, it, the word is not defined in the building code, you're right. Uh, we could ask the National Research Council for a definition of it, and we're going to be going to the National Research Council. We could ask them. It's uh, We could ask the provincial building administrator as well what that means. So there are ways of getting that. That's not necessarily our focus, though. I don't think we need to define a fence as a facility or a sidewalk as a facility necessarily because the settlement of the medium that now is caught, is moving toward that adjacent foundation is the issue at hand, and that, that's all we actually need. So I think that's yeah, why yeah. facilities and, have to and, define. And just and, well, the reason I'm asking is because I, you know, because I think this is the, you know, when I think we need some, I absolutely agree with you. If we we need a tool here, there's no question in my mind we need a tool, and and hopefully that this the the act could give us that. Um, but in your reading of it, if there was settlement of a neighboring property from an excavation where there was no building, it was a vacant property, what would the act do under that circumstance? That would, uh, I, honestly, I don't want to comment on that right now because that's not what we're talking about, first of all. We are talking solely about infill construction excavations. The act is very likely to address that issue as well because the act is created for the protection of properties mm -hmm. from, but I'll tell you that it has to be work on a, on a, on an infill site. It has to be work on a building site. So it protects the public and, and properties from the impacts of work with projects, any kind of construction, any kind of building, whether that's, you know, vacant lot that settling falls into that definition that may be a bit of a red herring what we're talking about here is when we have an excavation what do we do when that excavation is not within the boundaries of the cold right which means that if if there's any settlement of of a neighbor's property which is their right to have in terms this would be your argument which is their right to have in terms of the defense of their own foundation that then becomes an infraction yes and the thing about that is that it's a risk-based and objective-based code. So if the risk begins to appear, that is when the officer's jurisdiction is triggered. There doesn't have to be damage. And if it's getting, it's if it's across the property line, yeah. we already, Risk of damage. Yeah, we and already risk, have. Yeah. And at yeah. that point, a neighbor or, wouldn't, for instance, be able to walk next to their house on their property without there being a safety risk, which would be also their right, I presume. Their, their right is to not have that excavation cross their property line. Yeah. That their right is to keep their soil intact. Yeah. And their right is to have a secure fence next to them without be, it being on their property. So there's, you know, it's, it's, you can see the issues, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I, I, I've always understood these issues. I mean, we've always got hung up on, on this debate about, you know, what we can use the act to enforce and what we can't. Um, and that seems to me the really important point here. If we can use this act to enforce... The, the, the bad players, which I think is all we've ever really wanted, um, then we have a tool that we haven't been prepared to use up until now, and that's you. So that's why I'm just trying to get some clarity around that. Well, thank you for your question. And I think that what we need to recognize too is that it's not a balancing act. When we, this is a provincial enforcement regime. Yep. The city is privileged to be able to have this mm -hmm. work going on, but it's a, it, it's independent from the city project. It's independent from infill projects. It's independent from the city plan. This has nothing to do yep. with what the city wants to do with yep. infill. It only has to do with what the province has to do to enforce the building yep. code. Yep. So they're very separate. We're not balancing that. And uh, on that point, we had better start using that tool. Great. Thank you. I'm out of time. Thanks. I'll have to come around for a second round. Thank you. We'll go to Councillor Katerina. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thanks for all the presentations uh, this morning. Uh, sort of my takeaway from this is uh, uh, three different points. Uh, the builders are concerned about high costs. The public is concerned about the no enforcement uh, for excavation and demolition, those sorts of things. And the city uh, 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 uses uh, the language of uh, it's not in their uh, jurisdiction to deal with civil uh, matters, litigation, or problems that arise from there. So uh, I, is that, that's sort of what I get from, uh, from all the speakers today. And uh, so, Ms. Uh, Hartseff, the uh, uh, enforcement of, of uh, the safety code, uh, the rules and regulations, that is being uh, stated that it doesn't happen all the time. And that needs to be uh, uh, reinforced uh, by uh, uh, all the rules that are already in place that were not actually uh, being enforced. Is that what I'm getting from you, Ms. Hartseff? Well, that's right. I mean, the city has municipal safety code officers. They're accredited to apply and enforce the building code, and they're only enforcing it to fencing, and they're enforcing it to the building. Um, we have FOIP records of, a, of an industry workshop on February the 12th, 2020, and safety code officers are expressing concern, or pardon me, industry is expressing concern that safety code officers are a resource they don't want depleted because they need safety codes officers to inspect their buildings and finish their projects. So, you know, we have to make sure that there's enough resources. It, it's, not, it's not fair to say we have to ensure that we preserve the resources of safety codes officers to inspect buildings, and therefore we cannot send them out to inspect property damage. And, and so, then they're also complaining about delays in the project if they have to uh, uh, meet the requirements of the order. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's kind of about services. There's services right. to buildings and there's services to the public. Mr. Hart, Ms. Hart, so the, the uh, uh, enforcement officers, uh, uh, not an adequate number, numbers of them to uh, uh, address uh, all the infill projects that are going on and everything else that uh, the city is doing. So maybe to one of the uh, developers uh, here in that, uh, certainly a concern if you can't get your... Uh, um, inspectors out, whether it's safety code, whether it's a plumber, whether it's electrical inspection, all those sorts of things certainly uh, uh, make a difference in your timelines in that. But is that uh, something that should be uh, sort of you go around? Should the industry go around that and proceed without those uh, uh, inspections uh, uh, being done, even though it uh, will increase the cost uh, or the timeline of your projects? If someone from the development side can uh, can address that, there are rules in uh, place. But I can I I can talk to that uh, real quick. It's Mick Graham from Idea and Single Tree Builders. Uh, <clears throat> typically, at the end of a job, you apply for a compliance certificate. Usually, the if it's a spec house. Uh, or if, even if it's a custom house, the client's lawyer will request that. Um, or often the lender will request it. So that's a document that the city sends that verifies that all the inspections have been done. Okay, um, so with that, so the, the what we're talking about now is inspection of the fencing, safety codes, excavation. What, what no, do you sir. do? What do you have to do? Do you have to provide that? That you've actually complied with all that before anything else happens? That's correct. That's what the compliance certificate does. It, it verifies some, somebody at the city looks at the job and sees that all the boxes are ticked for all the inspections. Well, it sounds from a lot of the presentations this morning that uh, that's not actually occurring because uh, as you saw some of the pictures, uh, there, uh, you can obviously see they don't lie, the pictures don't lie, that there's an issue, uh, yet uh, very little uh, enforcement uh, was done. So uh, how, how is that uh, possible that on one hand, you can't go ahead without that uh, compliance, and yet on the other hand, you've seen uh, uh, photos uh, that they've gone ahead without compliance? So uh, there, that's, that's a two-part question. Uh, part number one is the excavation piece. 
Uh, the excavation doesn't get inspected by the city. Um, in this case, the safety codes, uh, OHNS folks were, were summoned and, and they did their work. Um, it, it clearly wasn't very effective. Um, the second piece is, you know, if there's a, if a, a person has a lawyer or a realtor that doesn't know what they're doing, uh, and doesn't know what to ask for, the compliance certificate, you know, that's another way for the system to break down. Okay, thank you. I'm out of time. I'll come back around that, Chair. Thank you. We'll go to Councillor Walters. Uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Essinger. Um, so maybe I'll start by asking, uh, is it Mr. T Tolsma? Don Tolsma? Are you still with us? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, so you, you've seen some of the pictures uh, provided by the presenters. Uh, maybe you could talk about how you would have, as a builder, avoided those circum that, that situation from occurring to the neighboring property. Well, I think communication long before construction starts will develop that relationship. Um, I think Mick touched on the fact that, um, I don't remember what percentage you said, but a lot of the, um, a lot of fences and a lot of, of property you know to the neighboring of these infills depending if it's a skinny or if it's not a skinny um will get damaged um and so you know uh, much like mick we included in our budget to replace those fences and 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 fix the the damaging to the neighbor's properties and and we you know we do our due diligence i mean some of these stories we're hearing today are you know they're they're heartfelt and and i think that I think we we take that into consideration that these are people's homes that were disrupting their lives and we're you know we're 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 revitalizing these communities and and some of that comes with a little bit of of pain but people have lived there for a lot of years so we have to approach that with a very sensitive approach and and talk to them about you know are you okay with having your sidewalk replaced are you okay with having your fence replaced put that in writing um the so, let me stop you there and shift yeah. to your advice on so that's how you operate uh but people who are builders don't operate that way and we end up in that circumstance what should be the remedy how quickly should that remedy occur and who's responsible for the enforcing the remedy in your opinion well i think if the if the if the neighboring property um cannot contact the builder um next door then I think the city does need to step in. Um, but I think the rules have changed. I mean, uh, the other big thing to look at is the number of, of issues that we've had. I mean, these 175 people that joined the survey, um, this is back since 2019, I believe. So this, this is the numbers, the numbers are relative. We have to look at it from a holistic standpoint. Right. But I'm so just talking about, and, and sorry to interrupt you, but I just like, I'm just, cause I want to really be solution oriented here in terms of yep. when certain things happen, how should those things be remedied? How quickly should they be remedied? And who's responsible for the remedy? So, you know, someone who's, you know, if you, as a good builder, you're affected by bad builders because mm -hmm. we have to reallocate resources that you may or, need. Or people that are not builders. So how, quick, how, how quickly in the case of the pictures shown by Suzanne, where you had the excavation problems and the sidewalk collapsing, et cetera, should that have been remedied? And how quickly should the city, in your view, someone who is invested in the good name of the industry, how quickly should the city be on top of that stuff? Um, I would say if the builder is not responding immediately. Right. Like 100% immediately. And therefore we should resource that stuff, you know, and it's, it's hard to, you know, build, you know, put resources in place for the worst case scenarios in all, at all, in all cases. But uh, ultimately if, we're going to be responding to those things immediately. That means we have to be nimble and have some capacity to respond immediately. Correct. Um, so Scott's on this call as well. Scott Hayes with Force. He's an excavator. This puts okay. a number of people puts a number of people at in in interesting situations because the excavator is not the builder, right? The excavator is a subcontractor. Right. So if an excavator goes there and we're going to, I just, we labeled them yesterday as kind of a tier one, tier two, tier three builder. Um, and he goes to work for a tier two builder that is not going to follow protocol. And the excavator shows up and he says, this is not, this is not suffice. Like we can't do this. That's a call that he can make at that point as well. 
And I think that's something where he can get the builder involved. They can have an on-site consultation. The neighbors should be involved. Um, you know, there's two things here. There's cost of the builder and there's safety. And then there's the, or three. So the cost of the builder, the, the, uh, the neighboring property and safety. Um, in my view, safety should be number one for, you know, for people that are going down that hole, because I don't think we want to see, see, uh, fatalities. Um, but I also think that the neighbors, um, they have every right to know what's going on next door and they also have the right to protect their property. And I think Jan made it, said it best along with, uh, I think Cassandra was, but they, they should be able to walk, walk down the side of their house. And if they're not going to be able to walk down the side of the house, they better have full, uh, full knowledge of why they cannot walk down the side of the house for that certain period of time. Okay. Okay. I'm out of time. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Beth. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm going to jump in before we go to the second round here. Um, and, uh, and I appreciated the answer and, uh, I'm going to go to, um, Ms. Samji. Um, and we talked about the education of builders and whatnot and how that has changed the industry but we're still getting a few of these stories or experiences that don't align. How do we educate those who aren't coming forward to get the, the, the information that's available to them, particularly on the excavation side where we've heard so much of the concern today? Well, I think um, one of the really good successes of the pilot program is we've only done it for a year. 40 companies have gone through it and we already have a wait list for a spring edition. And more people outside of um, the idea bubble and the CHBA bubble are starting to approach us asking, when will it be offered? Put us on a wait list. Uh, and as it runs more frequently and more often, it becomes more popular. People start seeing the logos of it, start seeing um, the benefits of it, also because it does have a carrot approach to it. Um, and because it has the demerit uh, system, which we thought was very appropriate and needed to make sure that those who are in the program uphold the values of Edmonton and uphold the building practices of Edmonton. So at, as that program continues to evolve, I think that there's a lot of benefits to it. Um, and then we're, we're spending less resources with those folks who have gone through, through it and we're able to divert the resources that we would have spent with them to those bad apples that are putting a, a black eye on our industry that really none of us want. So, and I, and I think there's comfort for neighbors to know that people have gone through those uh, courses and that there's some uh, demerits available to them. Um, how do we communicate, you know, encourage people to select builders that are good builders? So on our website, we do have all the people who have gone through the program publicly available. We all also have used... Um, our communications and relationships with the EFCL, they've promoted the program through their newsletter, which we've been inc incredibly grateful for. And the city of Edmonton has also put it into a few of their newsletters as well. Uh, but we really do need to do a better job communicating that this is an option for the community to look <coughs> Sorry, uh, that this is an option for the community to look at when selecting their builders. Okay, thank you very much. And my other questions have been asked. So I'm going to jump now back to Councillor Banga. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Sandy, uh, I don't know if you still remember my question, but if you don't, I'm, uh, I'm going to reiterate it. Again, it's uh, about goals of the city, viability of the project, and uh, uh, complaints um, uh, regarding enforcement and uh, addressing these uh, issues. Could you be able to tell me what, what would be like, where is the common ground? I think the common ground is in early communications. Um, one thing we've discussed at our board meetings that we would like to see move forward uh, is a bit higher engagement with the 311 app. We think that being able to send photos to the city of what's happening from the community members and the, the neighbors nearby would help to reduce uh, the time back and forth to explain some of the issues. We also need to teach the community that it's well within their rights to take uh, photos beforehand and come to agreements with the people who are building next door. Uh, it's also on the industry side to explain that they do have insurance. They, they are responsible for building or for putting back things that they have ruined um, or that have been ruined by accident. And so it's all about evol evolving together, working together and having that communication start early. 
Well, thank you. I did have another question for you. However, I'm going to go to uh, Mr. Raba. Uh, Mr. Raba, you said uh, there would be it would be beneficial to have, uh, I guess, shift some of the responsibility to the provincial side. There, would you be able to tell me uh, how that is going to help? Because as the city folks and inspectors and everybody is so close to the to the citizens, but then you go on to the next level of the government. I guess some that's why city was handling it like. You think it's possible yeah, you? to have it uh, referred back to um, uh, back to the provincial government and then have the proper solution? Yeah, okay. uh, I'm sorry, somebody's talking with their mic on, so I can't. I wasn't entirely sure what your question was. But let me see if I've got it right. Are you asking? Are you asking if it's possible to have uh, this jurisdiction removed from the Edmonton's accreditation and and put back to the a different agency under the supervision of the minister. Is that the question? Yeah, that's the question. And yeah. uh, I was even asking that if it's possible for the provincial government to do all that stuff that the city either is uh, unable to do it or uh, don't have the resources. Well, and that is exactly where we're going with this. Um, <clears throat> the city, it, 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 it's uh, definitely possible. Uh, that is how the safety code structure is, is works, and that is where the ultimate authority lies under the legislature. So the minister really does need to be involved here. Uh, let me just point out, though, that safety codes officers are under the jurisdiction of the minister. They're not the city's employees uh, to tell them what to do according to city policy. So we have a problem with that, but also I'd like to point out here that we're talking about education, we're talking about good builders. What I'm hearing is good builders are people who tell the neighbor, I'm going to damage your property, get ready. That is not a good builder. And that is not a good, that is not contemplated under the Safety Codes Act. The, the building code requires that, the building code defines acceptable risk. Let's put it that way. The building code defines acceptable risk. And that is when all of the other risks have been mitigated. It's not the acceptable risk is I'm going to damage your property and then I might fix it if my insurance covers it and I might be able to fix it depending on what happens and you won't be able to use your side yard. None of this is contemplated in the building and the safety codes regime. All of this is illegal. So that is our main issue here. If we are now going to the place where this is acceptable, we have to go upstairs. We have to get the minister involved. We have to go further because that is not how this is supposed to work. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dolsma, uh, question for you is, uh, again, this is uh, considering viability of the projects and uh, that dollar tw uh, 25 a day for road right away. Uh, I guess uh, the question for you is, uh, again, we're trying to do a balancing act between uh, I guess um, viability of the project and uh, and uh, everything else in the in between, and uh, you think the money is going to come from somewhere? So either it's uh, from the developer's pocket or is it from the from the taxpayer's pocket? Is it fair to draw money from the taxpayer's pocket and uh, basically help the developer out? So you're talking about the the bins, the twenty five dollar a day bin permit. That's correct. Um, well, I, I would I would I would kind of revert back and ask why why we need to charge twenty five dollars a day for the bin fee. Um, my comment would be that you know if the if if we're going to keep the sites cleaner by having a bin on the road uh, for an X amount of time and put put a time limit on that, um, we will have a lot of cleaner neighborhoods than the infill, and also. Um, if we have one parking spot designated out front for that bin, which would typically be for that property anyways, um, and with the city pushing with more bike lanes and more walkability, um, with different modes of transport, um, I just don't see the necessity to have the $25 a day bin fee. Thank you. I might have to come back to you later. Thank you. Yeah, your time's up, Councillor Banga. We'll go to Councillor Henderson. Um, yeah, I because it, it, I think this. Maybe I'll start with a question to. I'll start with Mr. to Mr. Graham, but it also I think it was Mr. Tolsma that brought this up, which is, 
the reality is most builders are managing to do excavations without creating the kind of problems that we're talking about. So it's possible, correct? Yes, sir. Um, very often what happens, especially if, if there's work in the winter, uh, you backfill in the winter, a bunch of that dirt is frozen. So in the springtime, uh, when it thaws out, uh, the dirt subsides and yep. that often causes the, yep. the undisturbed soil to subside as well. Right. Um, so, um, but it's, so, but, so if it's possible to do, if we're talking about 30 properties a year, and, you know, and I think mm -hmm. this is where we've always struggled on this. Those 30 properties are, we have not been able or have always said there's no role for the city in being able to make sure that those 30 properties are protected. And I think we're hearing um, that, that the, the Building Code uh, and the Safety Codes Act does give us some ability here. Um, we may also, I think, Mr. Graham, have some ability, if we can apply some of this stuff to our compliance certificates at the end of the day, that that's a mechanism we can also use that is not going to affect you at all. It's only going to affect those 30 people a year who are not playing by the rules. That we have never been able, we've always argued we have no ability to step in on that. And I, and it, you know, I, I think that's, that's the piece of the puzzle that we need to solve here is we, I, I, you know, hoping that everybody's going to come and play by the rules, I think, is not getting us there and is creating problems for you reputationally. It's creating a, a problems for all the good players as well as others. And, and I, I, I'm, I want to explore ways in where the city can play a role here in intervening to make sure that the bad players actually are penalized um, and have to comply and not just that we hope that they comply. So thoughts about that? Well, we're, I've been texting back and forth with Mariah, actually. Um, you know, what we're just sort of spitballing. But what I'd like to do is to develop a checklist uh, that a builder can go through with the adjoining neighbor and say, you know, this is I the condition of the fence. And then at the end of the job, we can go through it again. But that, that, the problem is that only works for people who want to behave. And we have far too many well, instances where people choose to cut corners, and the city is not taking any responsibility around those. And I think that's no, problematic. Perhaps, perhaps we could we could make some kind of a connection between that checklist and the compliance certificate. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering if that's a mechanism that we can use. Um, uh, recognizing that you know that 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 still doesn't deal with the problem of somebody who loses part of the use of their property for a period of time, which I think is problematic. Um, and, and probably should be unacceptable. Um, so I, understanding that sometimes things happen inadvertently, but when we're planning for them to happen, that does raise some interesting questions. Do you have any thoughts about that? It's a, that's an uncomfortable question. <laughs> I know it is, but it's the question that we yeah. grapple with here. And, and you know that what we're saying and what we may be inadvertently saying is it's okay for somebody else to impede somebody else's use of their property for a period of time here. And that seems to be de facto what we're doing. And that's a problematic statement. Yeah, I agree. And, and I, at, at this moment, um, I, I don't have a solution. Um, I don't think... Abandoning infill is a solution. No, but, uh, and, I, and nobody, I'm not hearing anybody arguing that's what's going to happen. And I do, one of the questions I'm going to have for administration, and I think I heard your offer on this, is I'm confused a little bit that we met with the infill, you know, infill uh, community group and we met with the builders separately and then we never allowed them to meet with each other. And that seems a bit, you know, I, I think having a joint meeting with everybody might, might be beneficial here in terms of actually trying to look for solutions to this. We, we have a bad habit of trying to mediate through the hallways on this, and I, we always end up in this kind of situation. I had one other quick question, so I don't have to come around for another round. Um, the fire hydrants are an issue, and I think there may be an interesting solution if we can actually begin to think about hydrants are dealt with, and it may not be tax base anymore. We may, there's a suggestion, and I'm, I fought this in the past, but I may be prepared to let go that we should begin to look at hydrants as a utility piece. But are there other pieces of the puzzle besides the hydrants that need to be part of this discussion, or is really is the hydrants the, 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 the big sticking point? Well, I, I'm, I'm worried that we don't know what we don't know. Um, hydrants are a problem. I've heard of 
people who are trying to develop smaller, you know, missing middle type projects, uh, and they find that the the electricity services in the area are inadequate. Yeah. So, you know, there needs to be a bunch of engineering work done to figure out where we're vulnerable. Okay, great. Thanks. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is uh, 11.59. I just, if I have consensus, I'd like to have uh, Councillor Katarina finish his questions so we can complete the panel. Is there any objections from my colleagues? No. Seeing none, then we'll go to Councillor Katarina to take us home for lunch. Thank you very much. And I'll be uh, fairly quick on this. Uh, uh, Mr. Graham there, you're, um, uh, and uh, Ms. Sanji, uh, going back and forth, uh, uh, putting together a list of uh, things or, or that the uh, developer would uh, would do or not do in agreement with the homeowner and that. Uh, with that, uh, would, would you anticipate it be legally binding to start with? That that be part of the process, uh, uh, that compensation for not fulfilling uh, the list or requirements uh, be legally binding? Uh, is there any recourse if, if some of the bad actors don't comply? Is that sort of direction you're thinking? Uh, Councillor Katarina, I think that these are the things that we can take into consideration and work with the city and with the residential working group as well as the EFCL uh, to come to something that we can all agree on to move forward. I would be hesitant to apply a yes or, or no without knowing even our jurisdiction at this time. Well, I, I, I think I'm asking the, the speakers here now uh, what their idea is uh, on putting a list together uh, for compliance uh, that uh, uh, the developer would, would meet or come into agreement. For example, uh, there's been the uh, uh, example of uh, uh, trespassing, using neighbor's water and power and that. Uh, if those things are, are realized, uh, should, should the homeowner be compensated for, uh, for that? Or they can enter into an agreement that allows or or does not allow uh, that type of uh, trespassing or going onto their property. That's, That's sort of the that, idea. Uh, those agreements are something that we do talk about in our course, and we could bring definitely to this working group conversation. But I'd want to make sure that we have a full conversation with them uh, and with other residents as well. I'd like to make sure that lots of different communities are represented. Uh, so we can create we can create a solution that works for everyone. Yeah, I think so. My, my my worry, Councillor Katarina, is you know, may, do we have to get a lawyer involved with every build? You know, and who pays for that? Ultimately, what we're doing is by adding all these layers, uh, all this extra administration and cost is making infill increasingly more expensive than greenfield and i don't think that's the direction that we want to go in the city yeah and 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 i don't disagree but uh you guys had mentioned uh putting together a list of uh uh and and dealing with the uh neighboring uh property uh uh but uh the effectiveness of that i don't know uh, so that's why i'm asking the question and uh, miss samji the uh insurance part of this and that uh, as a as a home builder obviously uh, as a developer, you have to have insurance for for different reasons, uh, and whether it's for employees, for uh, property, that sort of thing. So, is there a minimum standard that uh, is required that would cover uh, these concerns uh, for a neighboring property that the developer actually has adequate insurance? Is there a mechanism that we check or don't check? Uh, I I don't know. I would let Mick speak to that or Don uh, as they speak. That they build a lot more houses a year than I do. Okay. Yeah, so it, what, what's the insurance requirement? Uh, uh, I know my past life, uh, I needed, I think it was $5 million insurance to go on to uh, a lease site uh, many years ago. Without that insurance, yeah, it, in place, it, I, I couldn't even get to work. Right, yeah, it's $2 million in order to get uh, new home warranty coverage, uh, which is required in order to get a building permit or even a development permit. So is that adequate? Yeah, I've never had to pay two million bucks for a fence or a sidewalk. Okay, so there's there's adequate insurance to cover virtually all the costs incurred by a neighbor if, if that's found to be. That's yeah, correct, I but I, I, I think it, it would be a long, painful legal process to get it resolved. I'd much rather, I'd much rather team up with the neighbor and, and, and agree to things ahead of time. Terrific, okay, thank you very much. Uh, so my questions, thank you, Madam Chair. 
So, can Jan Hardstaff speak? Sure. Yes. Yeah, I've got some time. So you you're suggesting to um, to idea that they come up with a checklist of things that they must comply with. What I, I could save them some time. Just comply with all the laws. Ensure that the city is enforcing all the laws. There's no reason to have an agreement with neighbors that, well, what are we going to do if your fence if it gets damaged or whatever? Just enforce the law. That's the simplest thing. That's that is the simplest thing, and everyone will understand it. Otherwise, you're going to have to completely engage with all of the neighbors. And we have four out of five of the respondents, 175 respondents from 41 neighbors neighborhoods, say that they had impacts or damage. Yeah. 30 and properties with, with, with excavation failure damage, that's significant. So just follow the law and enforce the law. Uh, that's in place right now. And th those will be questions for administration of, of where the uh, bottleneck is and why why or why not uh, enforcement is not adequate uh, at this point and the reasons uh, for it. So thank you for that, Ms. Hart. Thank you. Well, thank you, and uh, I want to thank all the speakers today for coming and taking some time to share your experiences and your wisdom with us. Uh, the conversation is not complete, and we'll, we are complete right now. We're going to continue it at 1.30. Um, so we're at this point, we're in recess until 1.30. Thank you. And Madam Chair, um, if I can ask for any of the speakers that are on the meet, if they could please not rejoin the meet at 1.30, but instead watch on one of our live stream options available at edmonton.ca slash meetings. It will just help to improve the quality of the meet since the speaking portion is done. So I'm hopefully you all heard. If you're on the meet and you've been asking questions, please go to edmonton.ca and join through. Uh, one of the other methods, but do not log back in on this method. If you have something to say to any of the other reports, though, what do you do then? We've moved. We've already taken all this right now, so. Okay. okay. All right. right. And I've just heard Councillor Henderson, he says, if you have additional comments, please email them to us so we can include them in our deliberations. Um, all right, thank you. We are adjourned at this point. Thank you.
Welcome back to urban planning meeting. At this point, I'm going to do a roll call to make sure we're all back in our places. We'll start with Vice Chair uh, Councillor Bango. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Katarina. Hi. Good afternoon. And Councillor Henderson. I am here. That includes all of us and Mayor Iverson. I don't see the mayor on the okay. All right. So now it's our time to turn our attention towards questions of administration. So uh, I see we've already got people ready to go. So we'll start with Councillor Katarina. Take it away. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I believe Councillor Henderson uh, selected. So if you'd like to go first, uh, that'd be fine. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Henderson. Well, uh, let's. I, I have two sets of questions, but maybe to start with, because with this this piece around, um, uh, I suppose compliance is really what it comes down to, because I I think you know we've been at this my entire time on council, um, and I and I you know and I and I think we have to recognize that most. And I think it proves that it's possible to do these excavations without problems. The fact that it's you know a, a smaller percentage, but for the ones where there's problems, the fact that we are putting it back on the the, the real problem here is we put it back on the on the innocent party um, to deal with this. And it looks to me from the, what we've been presented that we have a couple of tools here that we could use that we are not using, and probably some legal obligation to use at least one of them. Um, and that one is is to say that you you cannot do an excavation that actually begins to excavate your neighbor's property um, or risks that happening, and that we have the tools to enforce that. And two, that we have uh, the compliance certificates that we give out um, that would be a tool that we could use to say if you have not done if you have not repaired the inadvertent damage to your neighbor, you don't get a compliance certificate. Um, and how we could use that as a tool. So those are my first two questions. Sure, so Councillor Henderson, I guess I'll speak to first the, the compliance issue. Um, we recognize that infill can have a huge impact, um, particularly when it doesn't go well. Uh, we have uh, changed our approach and our processes that uh, we will issue a stop work order immediately when there are issues. And so, um, where maybe in the past work had continued on other things, we now require the builder to remedy the situation before the development progresses. Um, there are challenges where you know we are ordering them to fix the neighbor's property, like the garage, let's say. I'll just use that as an example. Uh, we can't allow them to trespass or to cross onto the property line, so there is a relationship piece that the builder and the neighbor have to um, enter into. Uh, when it comes to compliance certificates, um, that tool is slightly different and just to provide some clarity and, and laws on the line if we need to uh, get a little bit more information. But a compliance certificate is looking at the development and the, that it's been built according to your permit and so that you meet the setbacks and the height requirements. That's the extent of a compliance certificate. But it would include things like like final lot grading and or should com I would hope include things like final lot grading on all those pieces of the puzzle and and if we so chose and said if you've done damage that I, I don't understand why we could not add that using our own our own tools to do so I mean giving compliance it is our choice whether or not to say something's in compliance I mean this council has the ability to say what compliance means I would assume through bylaw and, uh, and I don't know why, I understand we may not have given ourselves those powers yet, but I don't see why we couldn't. Uh, Councillor Henderson, if that was the will of committee, that is something we could explore. I think there's some implications, trade-offs, challenges with that that we haven't explored yet, and we want um, council and committee to understand if we were to go down that route uh, of using the compliance certificate in the right way. I'd also want to work with the department to understand if that was even the right tool to use in that case. Well, I mean, we've been we've been at this for a decade, and I and I'm really I do think I think we have to recognize that the simple fact that that so many of these builders are able to do this without having these problems suggests that we are not going to be impeding them by saying everybody has to has to behave as well as the good players and for us to take a role in enforcing that. And I and that's where we have not, you know, up until now, we've always said we don't have those powers and I think it's pretty clear we do. 
and I think we have to start using them, and I think that includes compliance. I, I would add the other thing in here that I think we need to watch out in terms of compliance is, is some of our rules that we've now done when we added landscaping, um, landscaping rules, because I'm hearing as well people that are not putting in the landscaping that they were obligated to put into according, you know, there's a number of places where we have the ability to say, you have not finished this job. Um, and, and we have not been using that in a way that's useful. Now, I get that probably when it comes to landscaping, you might end up giving an occupancy permit before you can complete the landscaping, so there's some complexities there. But maybe under those circumstances where somebody wants to move in midwinter um, and the landscaping, you know, maybe under those circumstances we can do something that we have done historically and say, if you want to do that, there has to be a deposit to make sure this stuff gets done. So, you know, those are, there are some choices here, I think, that, uh, or some kind of security that it gets completed. I, but we have to step up or we are going, and this has been the problem all the way along, we are going to lose the big picture game because we're unprepared to, to make the bad players play, play, play well. Councillor Henderson, I certainly appreciate the perspectives shared by the community um, speaking earlier today about the impacts that have been in, in the various excavation situations they've um, displayed. Um, so we have shifted from working with builders from an education perspective and bringing them into compliance to enforcement. So that includes stop work orders, um, implementing fines. We do a number of sp inspections throughout the construction of a, of a project. So um, through we have a development permit inspection. They go out uh, when you've just got your footing and foundation to see uh, you're building according to your permit. That team goes out again to ensure that you've built it according to the permit. We do lock grading inspections, a rough grade and a final grade and as you've noted depending on the time of year or how the building was or the the lot was passed off to the homeowner um, sometimes further improvements are done by homeowners as it relates to landscape improvements and then of course all the inspections done by the safety codes team or any complaints we receive we follow up uh, depending on the type and severity of the complaint and we prioritize uh, life safety and 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 safety of, of residents and neighbors uh, so certainly those kind of uh, concerns we follow up immediately and I'm out of time. I have to come around again. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Councillor Katerina. Uh, thank you. And just to uh, continue on uh, on that path, the importance of uh, of this, uh, you know, given the numbers, I guess on one hand is a small portion of, of uh, bad uh, experiences uh, versus uh, uh, some good ones. Uh, uh, Ms. McCabe, uh, you know, with the city plan. Two million people. What we're trying to do as a city in that, even one bad player will sour uh, the entire project uh, because that is the one that will be focused on. And we're so new into this process now with a new city plan, uh, this uh, project going on, and and the study of the pilot on the infill. That this to me would be the time that we make sure that we eliminate ev everything negative that could happen, and and that. The enforcement part of it, I know we keep saying education, uh, to have to educate a builder on what his responsibilities are, uh, I think they all know, uh, the ones who are not complying, they know what the rules are, uh, but they know that they can get away with it. And Ms. Pet uh, Petrin, uh, you know, uh, using stop work orders and uh, how that's enforced, uh, you heard the example this morning that uh, two stop work orders were, were uh, handed out uh, and they weren't adhered to. So my, I guess my question is I, I need to understand, first of all, uh, um, safety code inspectors, are they ours or are they provincial? Uh, let's start with that. Do we have jurisdiction over them? They work for us. Are they paid by us? Uh, can they be directed by us? Start with that. They're City of Edmonton employees, Councillor Katerina. Okay, so that uh, it was stated in the conversation that they were not, which I'm glad we can clarify that they are our own uh, employees. So in saying that, Ms. Petrin, uh, there's nothing stopping us from, from uh, having them do their work. Uh, is there a problem right now uh, that we don't have uh, enough numbers or uh, safety uh, code inspectors at this point? Uh, or, or is that driven on a complaint basis as well, too, that you act when you get a complaint from a neighbor? Or uh, do we have enough uh, resources to actually uh, enforce? 
So, Councillor Caterina, the safety codes officers have provincial authority, uh, provincial authority through the Alberta Building Code. And in terms of the staffing levels, um, you know, we we fluctuate based on service demands. But uh, in terms of the complaints that we're, we receive and the severity of the complaint, we will follow up um, immediately, like within 24 hours. So, um, you know, we are our, our, our Service levels are um, fluctuating depending on the demands that we receive from from the public in terms of complaints. Uh, okay, so that that for me seems to be uh, maybe one of the issues here that it's uh, complaint driven, like most of our bylaws, which then uh, the onus is again on the public or on the neighboring property to make that uh, uh, make that complaint or not, and we're not responding to it. So if we if we have issued a development permit. Uh, at, right at the beginning, why aren't we scheduling uh, inspectors in there uh, for excavation or demolition uh, on the onset without having to wait for a complaint about it that every infill property uh, permit that's given uh, requires a safety uh, officer to go out and, and uh, check this on our own, not uh, complaint uh, driven. What, what would stop us from doing that? So Except the numbers, obviously. Right, so we, we are out doing inspections for various reasons, a development permit inspection or our safety codes team looking at footing foundation. But when it comes to inspecting excavations, um, safety during construction is the responsibility of the contractor. If there are issues um, or whether they're noticed by the inspectors that are out or uh, through a complaint, we do attend to the site uh, as soon as possible. Um, and so in terms of the, the, the level of risk associated with uh, inspections, or sorry, excavations that are problematic, um, you know, according to the data, the, the numbers are low. I think there was uh, 13 issues that were identified in our compliance report that were problematic of the 208 or over 200 uh, safety code infractions that we received. Councillor Katarina, two quick things to add there. One, uh, this is about process at the end of the day, and we have a number of good builders out there who are following the process. And so if we were to add something in that was a proactive um, inspection where we had to go out every time, that would add quite a bit of process to the good builders. Now, with that being said, it doesn't necessarily mean that's not something we shouldn't do, and we could explore that if that was the will of uh, committee to do that. Uh, but we would have to look at resourcing levels, you're correct, uh, that we would need more resources to have a more proactive approach in this space. Yeah, I think I'm out of time, but uh, this is critical to uh, the long-term plan of uh, the new city plan and two million people. Uh, we're not going to get there if we can't uh, uh, get this right, and we're in the you know opening stages of this, and uh, resourcing has to be a consideration uh, at some point. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Thank you, Madam Chair. A uh, few questions. Uh, uh, according to the recommendation before us today in point one, uh, it uh, appears like there is no issue or the issue is uh, pretty minimal. But when we heard uh, all the people speaking today, uh, it sounded like the problem is a little more than minimal. So could you be able to shed some light on to, if you can, uh, whether this, this, I guess, lack of complaints is due to the actual number of violations or is, uh, uh, I would say, the, the, the fate of the public in the complaint system. So, Councillor Benga, the, the recommendation of 6.1 uh, in the report is to uh, cease the infill compliance team annual report uh, because we are moving to a more transparent and open approach in terms of our dashboard where we will be able to identify trends or concerns and address emerging issues going forward. When it comes to supporting infill and the work associated with infill and the complaints and improving our processes and the rules um, and our tools uh, to ensure compliance, 
compliance and enforcement. That work continues uh, through um, the action plan, the infill action plan. And so we continue to enhance our tools to you know, issue orders or tickets and penalties. We're considering increased fines in situations where there are multiple violations. And so that work uh, continues, uh, as well as the collaboration and education between community stakeholders and our development industry. Okay. And then uh, in the report, I read uh, that uh, we are exploring, administration is exploring opportunities to collaborate with provincial occupational health and safety. Does that mean we are currently duplicating these two processes or uh, are we trying to somehow streamline um, the process? I think, Councillor Bangar, you're referring to the exploring notifications to uh, health and safety referrals related yeah, to building permit right. applications. Um, so that is looking at how we can work with uh, that partner, that provincial partner, regarding excavation depths, if they are in excess of a certain height. Um, and we certainly, when we see excavation issues, we connect with the province immediately to uh, support follow-up. Okay. And... Uh we saw some pictures uh, of the sidewalk and uh, and I guess uh, excavation that did not go as planned. Uh, it was uh, pretty obvious that uh, uh, this is uh, uh, going on in some cases, maybe very rare. Uh, in those cases, uh, sure, uh, either us or uh, or uh, and the, uh, I guess, provincial inspectors, uh, whatever jurisdiction they're working under, are they can stop work. But what, uh, I guess, prompts uh, uh, the, the builder or developer to um, do those um, immediate repairs so that uh, neighbor's property does not suffer damage as a result. So, Councillor Benga, I'm going to pass it to uh, Mr. Rich from our Safety Codes Permits and Inspection team. Thank you, Councillor Benga, for the inquiry. Um, it is a, your example here is uh, is something that is differing on every every site that would be encountered, and it would be an evaluation by the Safety Codes uh, officer as to the risks associated with that um, that scenario. Um, there is a, a process in place to, to manage and deal with these and it's, it's based on the level of risk associated to it um, and risk to public and, and to, uh, to neighbors as well here in this case. Um, the scenarios posed here are, are extreme cases. Um, safety codes orders were issued for remedial actions and responsible owners and builders for these actions were making steps to, uh, to remediate them. Um, part of that step is to, to get those excavations filled as quickly as possible or, or stabilized as quickly as possible. And that's uh, some of the efforts that you can see through the pictures that were displayed today. Thank you, and I'll come back for the second round. Okay, thank you, Councillor Banga. Uh, I have a couple of questions as well. Um, one of the things that uh, concerns me is, is when people feel something's going wrong on their excavation, and that's usually when they start to panic, they feel vibrations, they're worried about it. Who do they call? 311? Is that... The, the best way for them, or do they call the builder? Like, what do we recommend? So uh, on each infill site, there's a development permit notification sign that does have the builder contact information and phone number. Uh, so that's one option, and certainly they can contact the City of Edmonton through 311, and we have updated the scripts for 311 to refer those directly to our safety codes team to respond immediately. So the, they know clearly what they can what should happen if they're, they're running into a problem. I'm just worried we don't want to really do any harm to someone's property, but if they feel something, they could call. So either the builder or 3 and one which will be direct to the safety codes, correct? That's correct, yeah. All right, now we also had um, 
EFCL in talking about the written notices that we send out today and we're going to discontinue those at some time and go to an online. Is that the concern that I heard this morning? It was a concern that was voiced. We are exploring making sure that our, our written notices um, align with our zoning bylaw. So through our zoning bylaw renewal, we'll look at which written notices go out for which development permits, but it's not a recommendation or a decision at this time. Okay, but I, I just thought it, they had a valid point that not everybody has access or is very knowledgeable about the website. So I think it's something as we go forward that we need to think about. Um, when I was hearing the concerns today, um, some of them date back some time. And I think if we do this in the future, hopefully we have fewer and fewer of those kind of complaints. Um, and I guess uh, the recommendation in 6.1 is to stop this annual reporting because of the, uh, the online dashboard. And I guess um, I'm wondering if we're doing that too soon, if we should try to mirror both systems first um, just so that we have an opportunity. I mean, I'd love to be able to say we don't have the stories that we're getting now. I, just some feedback on why you think that appropriate now and not a year from now. Yeah, Councillor, a great question. And really it's about um, working towards being having a system that's more transparent, that's more up to date than the annual report. Uh, but, you know, if that was the will of committee that we kept it in for one more year to report back on what we've seen through 2020, we would welcome that feedback through this process. And I, I think that might be what we need to do because I, I think we we still have work to do. And I think from what I've heard, we're sort of transitioning from education to more enforcement. We heard that mirrored in our community stakeholders this morning. I think if we could prove that that's working and I think it would give a, a measure of comfort to the greater community. Um, and not everybody is looking on the dashboard. So maybe there'll be that opportunity. Um, I got those. I will leave it there for now. And we will now go to Councillor Walters on the first round. Uh, thanks, Councillor Essinger. Uh, so sorry, I missed the first couple. I just caught uh, through the end of Councillor Katarina's question. So forgive me if I'm repeating these, but Ms. Petrin, uh, just remembering back to the photos that you saw earlier, uh, and I know you're familiar with those particular uh, cases because we've dealt with them in Park Allen. Uh, maybe walk me through, similar to the questions I asked Mr. Tolstma is, you know, what, what should have happened there uh, to avoid that? Uh, and then once it happened, what should have been our response to that? Councillor Walters, I don't necessarily want to um, speak to the specific situation, just what could have, should have, would have, but um, we recognize that the education uh, and collaboration with the community and industry is really important. And I think... Sorry to interrupt, but I kind of do want you to. Okay, <laughs> because, so... This is, this is the learning that we're that I've been struggling with is... Uh, you know, education and collaboration, those are important things, but I just, you know, we've been through a lot of these circumstances where it seems like it's, there's too much time spent between identifying a problem and it being rectified that I'm trying to figure out a way to kind of close that gap. Understood. So generally speaking, um, you know, we would have issued a stop work order uh, immediately and uh, direct the builder to remedy the situation immediately. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, in terms of a, of a builder remedying a situation, uh, that does take some time and, and, and response. Uh, there have been examples I've seen where, <clears throat> excuse me, the, it rains. And so I'm, when it rains, and uh, that causes challenges within the excavation as well. And so I, I think what I would do to kind of speak to that particular, those, those examples more specifically, I would, I would look to Mr. Rich to help support the, the what would we do differently. Um, but I think the, different, what, the difference of what we're doing now is that we are looking to issue that stop order immediately. And there is no work to progress on the site until you remedy that situation. Um, so maybe I'll just, I'll pass it to Mr. Rich to speak to that further. Thanks, Kim, and thank you, Councillor Walters, for inquiry. Um, just to expand on Kim's comments, that has been the, the shift, and we've 
we've talked a lot here about um, the education to enforcement shift that's happened. Um, that is exactly what's occurred here is it is a stop work order and remedial actions are required before there's any further progression with the, the subject property of construction. Okay, so then the question about enforcement and ca capacity. So if that is, if that becomes our MO, it's that, you know, we will enforce, you know, more, more uh, expeditiously. Uh, uh, our, what's our capacity to, to do that? So, you know, we get a call from a neighbor that says this is happening. How quickly can we go check it out? How quickly can we issue the order? How quickly can we, um, and the order I presume would include uh, remedies that they need to act on. Um, and there's certain, there's degrees of severity to the, to these circumstances, right? So maybe just talk about our capacity in the, in a really bad situation to act quickly and remedy quickly. Right. So thank you for the further question. Um, so it is our, uh, it is a prioritized item from our end and something that we attend and act upon as quickly as possible. Um, the extension of that and some of the situations that might arise um, would typically involve uh, a geotechnical engineer to, uh, to evaluate, um, to provide some solutions and, uh, and then next steps would be to action those solutions. So that is um, the undertaking of the builder or owner or developer here to uh, facilitate those pieces. Uh, we maintain continuous contact with them. And in the meantime, um, look for any way to secure and safeguard um, that property to the uh, to the public. Right. And, and I'm not sure if, if Ms. Owen or anyone uh, from her department is on the call. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Klatchuk is. Oh, Mr. Oh, hey, Rob, Mr. Klatchuk. Um, the questions around 311 triaging these quickly and the role that they play where do you see opportunities based on the stories you've heard today and if we've heard repeatedly you know there's so much positive stuff to infill but we we spend a lot of time talking about these these bad situations where where are there rooms for improvement in your view to make sure that these things are getting to our our people in compliance very quickly How about I come back on that uh, Bev, on a second round then because I'm out of time. Mm. Sounds good. And on second round, we'll start with Councillor Henderson. Well, just really quickly, two questions I'll ask next. What, my concern about the stop work order um, as a kind of go-to is in an excavation situation, particularly if it starts to rain, ironically, by doing a stop work order rather than a remediate today order may be counterintuitive. Councillor Henderson, that is part of the challenge, and perhaps I'll let uh, Ms. Petron or uh, Chad Rich uh, and elaborate on that in terms of the, the challenge with the tool. Chad? Yes, I think I, I, think I saw Kim looking at me. Uh, thank you. So yes, that is, um, that is part of the challenge. We, um, we don't have at our disposal the uh, the tools to to do the work ourselves um, per se no but but my my worry is that too often the answer here is is get your foundation up backfill and you've remediated which isn't the point um, and that 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 begins to be seen as acceptable remediation which which I think it can't I think if if we're prepared to accept that as acceptable remediation in order to lift the the, the the, the stop work order, then we have done nothing to create any disincentive for taking the risk to begin with to the builder. And I think that's the problem. Correct. And that has been some past practice. Um, that's the shift that we've recognized now in that all work comes to a stall until we remediate that situation. Okay. Which means buttressing, not backfilling, or you'd have to backfill and start your excavation all over again. Correct. Okay. Find another solution. Yeah. So there is, an, there is a disincentive to do that because of timelines associated with it. Yeah. Um, my other question, though, and I realize this is the tricky one, and this is the elephant in the room, quite frankly, but I think we have to grapple with it, is at what point we consider an excavation that, in, that negatively impacts a neighbor's property out of bounds. And I would think the building code would suggest it, any kind of incursion. Now, I realize that fences may be the gray area, because sometimes they're joint shared. Sometimes they may be right on property line. 
but, but I would hope, and I don't think this has been our practice, that if you begin to have the neighbor's property fall into your hole, if you begin to impede their ability to walk down their side of their safely, if you begin to affect anything on their property, I would hope we would step in. And I, and I think the building code also, or the safety code, would expect us to step in. And I don't think that's been our practice. And I think we sort of heard that there's this kind of gray area in there that I think it's time to actually address because uh, I think we're giving permission to something that is creating this problem. Thoughts? I think, um, and I'll, I'll maybe pass this to Mr. Rich here shortly, but I think, you know, in terms of how we leverage the uh, building code and it's uh, the impact of an excavation to property or structure, um, that nuance between structure, the house or the garage versus your landscaping or your fence. And so what we are doing now in terms of enforcement and that stop work order is requiring you to remedy the situation before further work and and uh, make changes or work with that neighbor to uh, resolve that issue. Now that's related to the structure or um, garage as an example or the house. And so Mr. Rich, I'll, I'll pass it to you to maybe speak further to that. Right. And I will just provide some other example in these cases where where a builder maybe has approached um, the neighbor and suggested that, you know, this fence is going to have to come down. Uh, we may excavate a little bit onto your property and here's what I'm prepared to, to offer. Um, so they would establish a level of permissions to access that land. And that's been part of the shift in, in the codes and how they've been written. Now we've shifted from a very prescriptive document to an objective based document or it does create some opportunities to, uh, to have those considerations. But if that does not happen, do we step in? Yes. Because I think if we're not prepared to step in, if that does not happen, and the neighbor has the right to say no, yeah? Correct? The neighbor would have to agree and should not feel compelled in any way because of a role that we would play in it to, to, to agree to something that they may not be comfortable with because we're not doing our job of if if they feel that we're going to say yes and therefore they have to sign off. Correct, and that would be the overlap with, with the petty trespass piece. So there's no authority to trespass on a neighboring property without permissions. Um, and and, and having, having, having some of your property fall into the hole would be considered a trespass? Yes, and also considered damage to adjacent property. And um, we the, and 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 how would we intervene in that situation? Because I think the problem here is that our intervention in the past has always been, well, you got to go to the courts, and and I think we are desperately trying to find a tool that can allow us to intervene in a different kind of way with a different tool rather than civic or civil. Councillor Henderson, perhaps law could um, weigh in here, but I will start the answer with. It's complex, um, and I'm not trying to abdicate any responsibility that the city has here, but it is private to private, and I do empathize in the situation where you've got a bad builder, where the neighbor is dealing with this situation. Now, we could further explore this. It's not something that we've explored in the past because we did start down this path with an education path, with having a dedicated team to this area, but we are starting to evolve. We've met the targets associated with infill, and perhaps this is something that we need to explore a little bit further um, in our work plan. Uh, it's not in our work plan right now, but if we could explore it further, if that was the will of well, committee. I'll come back on another line of question because I think we've been, have, we've been having this conversation for too long with it, and, and we need to do that, so... Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Thank you, and, uh, and maybe Mr. Rich or uh, Ms. Petron, uh, maybe to you, Mr. Rich. Uh, uh, in your capacity now, given it's been stated that this is complaint-driven uh, um, and the numbers have been small, are you are you satisfied with uh, uh, the number of uh, personnel or, or your capacity to actually respond to complaint-driven? And if it was to change to... Uh, not complaint driven that you would actually be responsible for every permit that's uh, uh, issued to actually go out and, and physically uh, look at every single location. And we're talking about the, uh, uh, the development side of things uh, with the number of uh, infills going on. Are you, are you good with what you have? But if, if that was to change from complaint driven, uh, would you be in the same position? And Ms. Petron or Mr. Rich, since you're the lead here, 
I think if we added a number of complexities or processes to uh, the inspection or permitting process, um, we would definitely have to take that back to look at resources. Okay, so, uh, you know, Ms. Petron or Mr. Rich, you're involved in that. Uh, you've been in, in, in this position. Uh, you understand uh, this. Do you have an idea that if, if it was to revert to um, a not complaint driven, uh, what you would need? Is that something that you've actually looked at or discussed? Uh, is there a dollar amount that uh, uh, at the end of the day could be presented to council as part of a budget, uh, given the importance of this item with, as I said before, Ms. McCabe, the overall new city plan and the growth and, and how essential infill is going to be to achieve any of those goals. If there's a dollar amount, then we can, we can either say it justifies it or it it really doesn't justify it. Yeah, understood, Councillor Katarina. At this point, we haven't done that work or associated with what the resources would be. We'd have to go away and do that body of work and come back with what a work plan would look like as well as some trade-offs in terms of what would be the next step next best step in this space. I'm not saying that we would, you know, go do all proactive inspections. We might want to be more thoughtful about the approach in terms of using data so that we're not adding process to the good builders. Yeah, and we have, uh, I mean, we have, uh, I think at this point now, we have a good idea of who the bad, uh, bad ones are, the good ones are, and the ones that are brand new. And uh, even the idea, if you consider the idea of uh, a category for, let's say, bad builder is under a category, a new builder with no uh, history, and a good builder where, where there are, a uh, good builder gets uh, all, obviously some incentives and might not have an inspection done automatically uh, with developer, but a bad builder uh, would uh, actually have, require, you know, uh, maybe higher fees, uh, maybe uh, an inspection done uh, with the excavation and that automatically, uh, regardless of whether uh, the neighbor complains or not. So just a, a different way of, uh, of looking at it that wouldn't add that much more red tape under all circumstances we you know we're not here to punish the good ones but to figure out a way to in, in incentivize the bad ones to actually comply uh so is that something that you would uh, uh consider or have considered i don't know yeah, Councillor Katarina, we have considered this and we've done some work in this space. Um, if Juan Monterosa is on the line, perhaps he could speak to the artificial intelligence model that we've built. Uh, it's, we haven't been using it for infill, uh, but potentially we, uh, we could start. And it's not for, it's not for non, it's only for non-mandatory inspections, but he could give you a flavor of some of the work that we've done. Okay. Um, to help categorize that. Yeah. And uh, I mean, even uh, with that, I mean, if these are things that we're looking at, or uh, would it be beneficial, Ms. McCabe, right now uh, to amend this or to ask you to, uh, uh, as part of your next reporting, to take a look at what sort of resourcing, uh, if we were to go to full inspection of everything, uh, middle inspection for, for, for just the bad ones, not the good ones, that sort of thing. Give us a, uh, an idea of what sort of resourcing we would need. And uh, we've got a spring supplemental coming forward. I don't know when the rec next report is, but whether it's spring or, or fall supplemental, that we have those, uh, that information in front of us and council will decide whether it's uh, uh, prudent to do that or, or not, whether it's relevant or not, uh, or whether it affects the city plan or not uh, going forward. Uh, Councillor Katarina, we could explore. I'd need to work with Ms. Petron here in terms of the timing uh, of when we could come back to council with what a, a resourcing package could look like associated with more resources in this space. I would caution that we would also want to explore process and if we have the right tools for infill for being able to determine where we should apply that process to or whether we're going to use it as a blanket process for all builders and then the implications associated with that. So that is a body of work that's not uh, not in our work plan right now to even explore that. Okay. So, um, all right. Time's up. Okay. I might I might add that to the uh, workload. All right, uh, Councillor Benga. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a couple uh, more questions. One is uh, in regards to uh, 
uh, the, the the funding we provided for uh, uh, infrastructure uh, improvements for the infill. It's a uh, 2.5 uh, million. Could you be able to tell me there are only seven projects benefited and what was their criteria and why were they selected, not the others? So, Councillor Banga, I will pass this to Ms. Sizer to speak to. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, there were seven projects funded, um, and they best met the criteria that we set out at the beginning of the project in collaboration with industry, which included IDEA and CHBA. So a few of the criteria were, were they in proximity to transit? Did they meet uh, the goals of city plan for the nodes and corridors? Um, were they missing middle type density projects? And there were some other criteria that we used to establish where funding would best be placed. Okay, and uh, the next uh, question is about that $25 per day for the lane occupancy, whatever you want to call it, on those yards. Uh, are we working uh, under the cost recovery model on in that aspect, or uh, we are, uh, we are uh, compensating from, from the, I guess, other city funding? Councillor Benga, I'll nope. pa pass this question to our, our Parks and Roads team to speak to. So, Councillor, this uh, initiative was part of work we did about two years ago in terms of trying to uh, get a better panel on disruptions for mobility, but it also connected in with the infill work. So, uh, fundamentally, it was really intended to uh, try and minimize disruption uh, for different uh users of the network, particularly the vulnerable road users, and in neighborhoods as well. But I'm going to have Ms. Bastini just comment a little bit on some more of the specifics around the uh, charges regarding the permits. Uh, good afternoon. Um, yeah, so, uh, Councillor, to answer your question, in terms of the fee being cost recovery, um, it's not a cost recovery. Um, it's the, the fee is actually structured to incentivize uh, the user to, um, to project plan and minimize the impact and disruption to the road right of way. This would include um, uh, the public parking space out front of, um, um, of, a, of a property, the boulevard, um, sidewalk, and um, in a lot of cases, uh, a bike. Okay. But the par parking in front of uh, any place is uh, not belonging to um, one particular uh, property owner. It's for everybody to use, isn't it? Uh, yeah, precisely. So that that space is public, and uh, and we um, we treat it as that with um, with the permit. Okay. So somebody suggested was adding a red tape. Would it be, would there any, be any matter this uh, statement or do we, um, I, I fail to understand it. I'm sorry, um, you cut out a little bit. Is the question around um, the permitted use adding red tape? Yeah, it's, uh, it's about the same thing. Uh, and that weren't twenty five dollars per day, or uh, um, yeah, that's adding red tape. But I fail to see how is it contributing to the red tape. I guess uh, thoughts, and uh, you know, once they get the permit, and then then they got to deal with uh, that lane occupancy, or uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, precisely. I can answer that. that so, so really what, what we are talking about is um, our road use fee. So if there is an impact to um, the public right of way, um, there, is, there is a road use fee that's attached. And whether that's an on-street construction maintenance permit, and um, in this particular case, uh, the bin permits that fall under um, the regulated use of road right of way, um, it's, and again, I, I should note that um, that using road right of way is often a discretionary use. 
and um, and often not um, not the primary route um, for a lot of development. So um, we do recognize that in some cases that um, that road use may be required, but we do want to minimize that that sidewalk or parking space or or roadway, and that twenty five dollar a day fee is that that incentive to project plan and potentially better use um, the space around a development to um, to minimize the impact to to adjacent stakeholders. Thank you. My time's way up, and I might have to come back for another round. Thank you. Thank you. And on the second round, I have Councillor Walters. Thank you. Uh, so, Ms. McKay, if there was a, um, a suggestion made in the Q&A with the speakers in terms of things we can do, and, and Ms. Hartstaff had made the point that one thing we can do is, is to apply our laws. Um, I wanted to give you uh, an opportunity to respond to that. You know, I think there's some, certainly some sense from our community that we're, as we've been talking about today in great detail, that we're not doing that. Um, I, I just wanted you to be able to respond to that and 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 then I'll follow up. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Walters, for that opportunity. I think the department takes a very thoughtful approach and a risk-based approach. I mean, this is a challenge here that uh, when it's happening right beside you, it can be really uh, a big problem. But overall scope and scale of this is that the vast majority of builders in Edmonton are doing fantastic work in this space. And so where, where we do want to focus our resources is where there's an immediate life safety issue. And I know the department's very thoughtful about that and getting out right away. Uh, so I would say we are applying our rules with that, um, with the with the lens of risk base, as well as shared accountability with the city building industry. Right, and so the education, assessing risk, shared accountability, and then you know we get into more specific questions around enforcement, which I think is kind of the dominant theme of the day. You know, like if I, if I compare this to our tra approach to traffic safety, you know we. We put a lot of emphasis on engage or on education and engagement. We, we also put a lot of emphasis there on enforcement as well and, and accountability, which is why we have a photo radar uh, strategy. Uh, you know, to look at something similar, what more specifically, in your view, can we do uh, to increase our enforcement capacity when we have situations like the ones that uh, we saw today? Councillor Walters, I think I'd want to explore that further with the department about what the right tools are and about how we continue to create that enabling um, environment within the development community at the same time as being uh, being thoughtful about compliance where we've got the bad actors. It's not something that I have a direct answer to today, but what I will say, in order to do that work, it will require some more resources because the department has been focused on the zoning bylaw renewal and our district planning framework. Okay, and, and I, yeah, so, and then I, I guess, Mr. Klatchuk, are you there available? I am. Okay, so, you know, I don't know, I know we have the, so our 311 process is we have the infill compliance team and we have our mature neighborhood liaison folks that are, you know, all in this space of trying to help deal with, you know, communication and response. Um, there's lots of questions people have just about zoning and about permits, et cetera, and then we have these circumstances where things have gone awry so maybe you can provide if you can provide any any input on to how you think we can improve in terms of and how 311 and your shop can help us improve our response time to some of these these um, off the rails uh, stories um, well thank you for the question and I think some of the the most important part is we've been working hand in hand with the team and the compliance team because I think that the hard part for an agent is to make sure you can pull in some of that local knowledge, things that are happening on the ground, and make sure we can get that over to the team. And um, our initial time uh, when we first started, maybe we weren't capturing the right stuff that, that would help and help prioritize and triage that stuff. So that's been a really big focus in working with with the internal teams on making sure that a 311 uh, agent has the ability to answer the right or ask the right questions to gather that information from from citizens uh, when they call in. So that's been really our, one of our big focuses. And, and then the direct line, how would you describe the direct line from identifying a, an imminent problem 
like a shoring collapse or an excavation problem uh, from the 311 agent to someone in compliance? Is it a phone So call? we have a we have a very good connection there and and the ability to prioritize and, and handle the emergencies. We uh, the team in the safety codes area and and whatnot. We've we've got that those good connections. I mean, I think it's always a bit of a an important trying to understand the imminent danger versus um, how it may be described. So that's some of the work we've been working with the, and getting the feedback back from that team when what how we did capture it. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna run out of time here, but I hope I'm wondering if the committee has any specific action I'll provide. I'll I'll hang around to see about that but you know i appreciate administration's responsiveness to our office when we've engaged in these things i think there's always great great response time but i think the question here today is when the problem emerges in the neighborhood and you know going through the counselor's office isn't necessarily the best approach or the fastest approach to making sure that we're responding quickly and have the processes in place and the resources to do it so thanks for your indulgence uh uh counselor Esker. You're welcome. Now we'll go on to our third round, I believe. Um, and I think we're winding down on questions, going into motion soon. Uh, ben, uh, Councillor Anderson. Yeah, and I and I do. I think administration was going to be working up a motion for me, but I, I wanted just to explore one more thing, and then I and I then there are the other reports. So I had a couple of quick questions on them too. Um, the compli the other end of this, the compliance certificate piece. The fact that people are able, you know, in that in that case with the uh, that we heard about somebody that was, you know, managed to move in, managed to live there without a compliance certificate, gives me concern, and and uh, and I think that becomes particularly important around the 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 the, the lot grading issue, um, which is I'm amazed that your numbers are this low. That means you're not hearing about a whole bunch of the complaints because I, I my office alone heard this many complaints, so. Um, I'm wondering what what mechanisms we have to make sure nobody can actually pass on to the owner. A builder can't pass on to the old owner if there's no compliance certificate in place. It, that should not be possible to do. We should have a system that can stop that from happening or what's the point of a compliance certificate. So can I just explore a little bit what happens at that end of things? So I'm gonna um, pass this to Ms. Pin to uh, speak further on the compliance certificate. So, Councillor Henderson, maybe I can shed a bit of light on the compliance certificate process. So, the compliance certificate is typically something that comes to light during that real estate transaction of purchase and sale where uh, the buyer and seller will contract to provide that compliance certificate to the eventual purchaser. Um, oftentimes, where you hear folks circumventing that process, there are... Um, other avenues available where you don't actually have to obtain a compliance certificate in order to transfer the property. It, it, um, there are other mechanisms that you can purchase, title insurance, there's different product, products to provide uh, assurances to a purchaser just about the suitability of title, not to get too far down the road of real estate uh, to a law. So, so a compliance certificate isn't an essential element, shall I say, Councillor Henderson, of that purchase and sale contract. And, and that might be where you're seeing well, some of the... Well, then we've got a glitch because, because part of the compliance from our point of view is to protect the neighbour for things like drainage. And, and if we don't have a way to enforce that, um, if, if we don't have a way to even know that it hasn't happened or in, in, intervene, if we don't have a, have a way to make sure that someone doesn't get their final permits um, and their final sign-offs, then we have a problem and a, and a flaw in our system that may not be about the compliance certificate, it may be about something else. I, I understand your question, Councillor Henderson, and you're saying if there's a private to private matter, uh, how, does, how does that home or how does that builder get all the permits? How do they get that final permit? And right now, uh, there isn't a way for us to uh, intervene, and it hasn't been our recommendation to council in the past to intervene in those private-to-private -private matters, because the certificate is really about compliance to the development permit. But, but we, have, we have interests on lot drainage that are both public and private that we need to have a way to enforce. And we, it sounds to me like we are not giving that to ourselves. And we do for drainage. Go ahead, Ms. 
Yeah, so just related to the drainage piece and lot grading, um, we recognize that issues often arise given the mature neighborhoods and, and the settling of, of uh, the land over time and, and development has increases of uh, areas that are not absorbed uh, for water. And so we are working right now on Action 17, which asks this or calls for the city to investigate and improve our infill grade, lot grading processes. Um, so this study will conclude uh, in Q2 of this year that will set um, a number of options and recommendations to improve how the city should structure and oversee infill lot grading to align with our objectives as a city, city plan, as well as stakeholder uh, uh, recommendations or stakeholders' expectations in terms of how we deal with lot grading. Because my feeling is, from everything I've hearing and read, that, correct me if I'm wrong, that the, the, the codes, the safety codes, are not just about the protection of the new owner, they're also about the protection of the public interest, and that includes the neighbors, that includes our interests. And that we have to have a way of protecting those interests, or otherwise, why do we have the rules in there to begin with? It's not just about protecting the homeowner. So um, I think that sounds like, it's a, like, like there's a missing piece of the puzzle here. We have rules in place that are around certain kind of protections that we're not actually giving ourselves the ability to follow up on, and that worries me. So, am I making sense? Absolutely, and I appreciate those comments, Councillor Henderson, and I think when we look at what our current tools are, like a compliance certificate that is looking at, does the development align with the development permit? When we do safety code inspections, does it align with the Alberta Building Code? Lock grading inspections, does it align with the lock grading plan? And, and there's this, this piece around the private to private issue around how do we close the loop that those issues and, have been addressed. And, and our development permits, all of those things are as much about defending the public interest as they are about the interest of the owner. And that's, and that's the bit that I think we have not been stepping up on. That's a component of it, Councillor Henderson. I think we have been stepping up on it. We have been improving our processes. We've got an infill compliance team. Uh, I, I do hear you that there yeah, is a private I, no, I private. I think there's a whole bunch of stuff going a whole bunch better. I absolutely agree, and I think I'm out of time. But I, I, sorry, this, I, I think we've made huge progress. I think there are these two areas where we're not there yet. So I'll have to come around for another round. Sorry. No worries. We're getting to the heart of the matter. Okay. Uh, and I have Councillor Banga on... On next, Councillor Banga. On third round, uh, um, Madam Chair, I think uh, Councillor Katrina was before how I ended up uh, jumping the queue. Okay, we'll defer to Councillor Katarina then. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Uh, no need, but uh, uh, I think a lot of the questions have been answered in that, and uh, I think uh, Councillor Henderson is uh, uh, crafting a motion in that. What I would like to see, uh, Ms. McCabe, and, and uh, hopefully that's beneficial uh, to you as well, too, if you could uh, compile uh, the, the, the need or what would be needed in order to uh, comply with enforcement and maybe on the lens of looking at sort of three different categories so that way good builders are not tied up in this. Uh, but bad builders are, and the new builders that we have no history on uh, might be able to either enter one category or the other. It could be fees to good builders or bad builders, the difference, and to new builders, so that way everybody has an incentive to get to the good builder status, where they don't incur those uh, costs. And uh, what your department or what uh, uh, safety goals department, what they would need if, if we were to be proactive versus... Uh, complaint driven so to give us that idea. Councillor Katarina, we could start that work. That would be a major body of work because we'd want to work with uh, uh, groups like the residential infill group. We'd want to work with the C with CHBA and idea through that. I think what we could do is we could come to SOBA uh, with what a, a high-level resourcing plan would be to do that work as well as um, some immediate resources in the space if Council would like us to be more proactive uh, with uh, excavation inspections. Then we could go away and do the work and come back uh, with what all of those implications would be for us to further refine uh, a resourcing plan and a work plan in this area. Okay, so that, that would be helpful to you. I mean, doing that, I don't, I don't want to put onerous uh, amount of work on you, uh, Ms. McKay, but given the fact that, as I stated uh, the past three rounds here, uh, this is critical now at the starting point in order to deliver your city plan on virtually everything, because if, if there's no trust in this process right now where we have the opportunity to build that trust, and, and that's what you're going to need going forward for the next uh, number of decades is trust 
in the infill uh, uh, projects going forward that people buy into. Majority do now, but uh, as more of these stories come out of uh, bad uh, circumstances, I think that uh, uh, buy-in is going to be eroded and it's going to make your job be that much more challenging uh, uh, for you and, and for the rest of us. So uh, without making it onerous, if that can be you know, part of the work, high level, uh, at, at this point for SOBA, uh, that would, I think, be extremely helpful and that council make the decision whether uh, uh, that money is justified or not. And given how important the city plan is and what we're trying to do, um, I, I would state right now that it's extremely important that we have the right resources in order to uh, carry this out. Councillor Katarina, I agree that creating trust in the space is extremely important for delivering on the city plan, and I believe the department has been really focused on that over the last few years. This was going to be part of our work plan, but it would be further out in our work plan, so for us to accelerate this work, we'll bring something to SOBA that allows council to consider what the resourcing implications are associated with that. Okay, and Ms. McCabe, uh, uh, I'll ask uh, Councillor Henderson if he uh, would put it into his... Uh, 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 item that way we don't have two or three different uh, amendments from uh, committee here on on some of the stuff and and I'll leave it up to you on what you could provide for uh, for soba or not uh, if, if there's even more information than there is now that's great and if you need further instructions after that then that that's great as well too so I'll leave it up to you and uh, councillor Henderson if they want to if he wants to include that in there Okay, um, thank you very much, Councillor Katarina. Now, Councillor Banga, did you have further questions? Uh, I just didn't want to lose you. I, I do just uh, uh, maybe a couple more questions. There, uh, uh, sorry to keep harping on uh, education, etc. Uh, it is sure sounding good, but with the only avenue for a property owner who suffered damage because of somebody else's work or their neighbor's work for them is to go to a civil court. Is that right? Councillor Benga, that's correct. So, um, it uh, again, it does not help them and that uh, immediately it goes on court process. We all know how does take and uh, so this person might be suffering for uh, for a long time or any anything is done or any damages are provided but in the meantime they have to I guess take care of the problem out of their pocket or something so, Councillor Benga, depending on the situation, there there can be involvement uh, with this with the city through the stop work order and our direction to remedy the situation. Um, there is a need and a, a, re a requirement for the builder and the adjacent homeowners to have a relationship or to build a relationship. And certainly, our infill compliance team is is supportive in those conversations and um, provide a number of tools and information for for both the builder and the neighbor to to work through those discussions. So in doing all that, uh, is the city liable for anything? Probably a lot of questions. I'll pass it to uh, Ms. Inkpin to answer that question, Councillor Banga. Sorry, Councillor Banga. Um, I just want to confirm, in doing all of which steps you feel like um, you're curious about liability, just to clarify. Okay. So, could you clarify the question? My apologies. Well, this is uh, sure uh, this person can go to court. And again, uh, I am again saying this is a long process. But in the meantime, th there is no help for the for the sufferer of the prim uh, property damage, uh, whose property is damaged. So, is the Anything that person can somehow uh, ask for, I guess, a situation to be remedied so that they don't have to pay out of the pocket? So I, I do apologize. I'm going to pass this one along to uh, my colleague in law who deals with this more specific issue, Ms. Leela Ramsway. Um, so I'll just pass that along to her for now. Uh, Councillor Fanga, there is um, 
there is always the possibility of the city being brought in to a civil litigation. Whether or not that would be successful is really the court's determination. Um, as well, just another thing to point out as well is if a civil action is brought, the homeowner that's affected can often bring their homeowner's insurance into this, which can facilitate the homeowner's, um, if there is a civil action against the builder, that can provide some facilitation to the homeowner. Okay. And uh, just one final question is about uh, the $2.5 million we provided uh, uh, to support uh, infill. And uh, I don't know who's going to comment on it. Did we I, uh, reach a goal or uh, our objective? In terms of the um, aspirations that we the, have? As the a impact. Yeah, impact of that means the seven projects, how many projects the units we created. That's all. Oh, okay, so there were 112 units created out of the seven uh, projects that were successful in the fire hydrants program. And so okay. we do consider the program, the pilot, it was a pilot program. Uh, we do consider that the, the program was successful in what it was looking to achieve. Okay, that's all I want to hear. And uh, presuming that uh, Councillor Henderson is going to bring this motion, and uh, uh, I am good with the questions. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to turn over to uh, Councillor Emerson, who I think has some motions. Well, I, I'm not convinced that this is, because I'd asked administration to draw something up, and I'm not sure this does it yet, but why don't we get it up on the board so we can at least talk about what we're working with and maybe answer some questions about it. So if the clerk can put up the motion that's being proposed here, and I think it answers Councillor Katarina's question. I think it answers Councillor Essinger's questions. I'm not sure it quite goes as far as I'd like to see us go in terms of understanding how we're going to deal with the question of the safety code on the excavation and, and exploring what we may be able to do either with this compliance certificate or another kind of compliance certificate that can make sure at the end of the day we can, we can, we can play a role in making sure that builders live up to their obligations. Uh, understanding that we, you know, understanding and I guess what I'm trying to, I guess my question would be, um, it's not necessarily about insisting that getting in, in the way of saying you have to pay for this, but we do have a tool in terms of saying we are not going to give you a certificate of compliance until you have satisfied these things. That's a tool that's available to us if we cho choose to use it. Um, to say we would, you know, we would do it, and we still can't comply it if, if, a, if a builder then decides to go ahead and sell the property and the owner takes it on without that certificate, that's their lookout. Um, but we could at least, I think, use our ability to, to, if nothing else, it flags for the new owner, which I think is part of our obligation as well, that there's unmet, unmet responsibilities here. And I think that's a service to the new owner, quite frankly. So thoughts about that? Yeah, Councillor Henderson, I think we, that's what we need to follow up on to look, look at and explore the, the current tools that we have and, and maybe there's another tool that we need, could consider yep. that provides that accountability for those private-to-private private matters. Just, I'm not sure that it's explicit in this motion, that's all. I, I, just, I think we need to be explicit because um, we've danced around this so many times. So I don't know how to work into the motion that, that we want to, that, that we really need to go back and look at our responsibilities around the excavation permits where I think we have been not necessarily following the letter of the law. Um, and I think we have to, because I think we probably make ourselves liable, quite frankly. Somebody could come back against us if we haven't, if we haven't lived by the safety code piece. We have a responsibility there. Um, and then as well, look if there's a way we can use, use something, either the compliance certificate or something like the, the compliance certificate to at least flag at the point where there's a transfer that not all obligations would be met. So, uh, sorry, Councillor Henderson, may I? Yep. Uh, the second part of the, your second part here, we were trying to capture that through the related to private to private issues. So improving construction and accountability. So I'm not sure we will explore the compliance tool through that part of the motion. I'm not sure that that's the right tool, but we will explore Can what we, the right maybe, tool maybe is. Maybe even listing what sure, some of those, we maybe write, we need to put in like, like the use of a compliance certificate or something yeah. like that so that we for actually example, name it. Yeah, yeah. For example, the use of yeah. a compliance certificate. The first component of your, uh, that you'd like us to explore in terms of excavation. Um, um, we should put that into the motion. Yeah, because I, uh, I think it's I think it's about it's not about increased 
compliance. It's about enforcement of compliance. Yeah, so uh, after the end, uh, uh, increase enforcement associated with um, excavation issues, question, or then comma. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not even sure it's increased. Well, it's increased, I think, in Councillor, Councillor Katarina's motion is asking for an increase in our, in our being proactive. I think there's something here about even on a complaint base, we need to be we need to we need to be firmer about enforcement of compliance. Now so, maybe we can't direct you to do that. I'm yeah, not sure. I'm not that sure may that be you getting into gray area. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. Do that as right. my. Yeah, yeah, understood. No, your point's taken. Um, okay. All right. Anyway, there's the motion, um, and I so I think it deals. So as a kind of starting place, and, and Madam Chair, I do have some questions about the hydrant, but I thought it might be better to get this out of the way first and go okay, back to those. Does that, that work? We'll yeah. do each one of those, okay. Uh, I, I have a couple of questions on, on this um, based on a conversation. Uh, for example, uh, what I heard uh, when I see point one is for increased compliance and additional resources for excavation inspections, but I also talked to, I heard um, saying that there would be some cases, maybe they're uh, deemed good builders versus bad builders or new builders. Does this give you that uh, continuum in this? Because it doesn't say it. It doesn't. So part one of this motion, what we would do is we would do a pretty high level analysis on what we could do right now between now and the spring budget in terms of adding some additional resources in this space. Uh, one part of that additional resources would be to do part two of the motion, which would be to start to look at the tools and approaches uh, to, to um, increase uh, the compliance in this area so we don't so that we could understand that it might be a, uh, it might be using our data and building some models to understand uh, what defines a good builder and a bad builder but we'd have to scope that out at this point I'm, I'm not comfortable speaking to what that would be so part two of that motion was intended to understand those processes. Okay, does it also get to the fact, because we talked about the gray area for when it's private to private, it's their issue, it's not a city issue. I took that to be the one under part two. Um, so is that in there as well? That is in part two as well, that private to private um, and the accountability throughout the construction process associated with that. And if, uh, when we return back, we'll come back with some options about the city uh, increasing our role in that space and what the trade-offs and implications are associated with that, as well as the opportunities. So, and that would deal with, um, I guess I get more calls about the drainage issues, you know, come and step in my backyard and up to your ankles and because of what's happened on the infill. So will that have us have that conversation Will you come back with options on how that's impacting us? That's part of the compliance, right? Uh, it is part of the compliance and the, the complaints through the lot grading team that have how they follow up, but we are um, doing a big project around lot grading um, and looking at how we can improve uh, our structure, how we improve how we deal with complaints and um, stakeholder expectations around that. So we're looking at lot grading, effectiveness of our practices, our processes, our guidelines, our bylaws. So um, when if there are any changes to be proposed or considered through that, we'll be back to committee to have that discussion. Okay, and I do appreciate that it does come back with the annual update because I, I don't think we're quite there yet. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm, I click back on because I'm going to suggest a couple of minor changes okay, here. Okay, I, um, I don't see anyone else, yeah, so go ahead. I, I actually, <clears throat> I just, I, it just seems to me still wishy-washy. So I, the administration work with the community and industry stakeholders to explore tools and approaches on how to ensure accountability. Because I, I, I don't, I think we've done the communication work. I think that's what we've been doing for the last number of years, and it's not getting us there. I, this is about ensuring accountability. We need tools to do it. And I think there are some that are available to us um, uh, uh, to related to private to private to private issues. And I, I'm wondering we should add private to public issues, quite frankly, because um, I think our interests are at stake here as well um, throughout the construction process and improved relationships. You know, the relationship worked great. You know, we can keep that going. Um, uh, yeah, and and I, um, yeah, it's maybe maybe increased compliance. I, you know, I think we have to be clear that this is, this, this we should be at 100% compliance. That's the point of the safety code. 
Um, I, I, I know there are going to be mistakes made. I know there are going to be bad players, but our objective has to be 100% compliance. Anything else is to accept unsafe conditions, which I think is a problematic place to start. So the, the challenge... I know we can't guarantee it, yeah, but that has to be our objective. It. We can't yeah. guarantee 100% compliance, and we do work with a risk-based approach to the work that we're doing. That is what's um, in our QMP. I, I don't want you to think that that means that we are uh, dismissing things that are immediate safety issues. Uh, um, yeah, we're not dismissing things that are immediate safety issues, but I think 100% compliance is. is a pro I, I understand. I'm what not you're suggesting 100%, yes. but I, but I, I'm worried about the word increased because it it implies that um, to explore work plan for increased enforcement, I can get, and uh, that 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 may be the issue, um, but I'm not sure it's about increased compliance. Suggests that we're prepared to, so I think I'd be more or increased enforcement of compliance. I think the point, I think Councillor Canary's point is we need to up our game on enforcing compliance, um, not just increasing compliance. I understand. Uh, may I make a suggestion? Absolutely. Uh, to explore, uh, how about just to explore increased resources for excavation inspections and, and compliance. And enforcement of compliance. Enforcement and compliance. Okay. I just think yeah, the word enforcement better. needs to be in there. Yep. yep. Did, Madam Clerk, did you get that? Okay. So I think uh, I'm still, it still feels, um, and, and I guess I have a timeline question here. Because uh, I, you know, if this is, if you're, we're a year away, which would, you know, it'd be this time next year when this report comes back. I, is there any way we can move some of this work up and well, have it before? You know, I because I, you know, I think I, I quite frankly, if we could have some better answers before the election, there would be some definite advantages to that. We are suggesting that we came if we come forward with the soba uh, in the spring, okay. that there be some more resources put to this right away, which okay. could help with, uh, in, with, which could help, uh, but to be more robust in in the work plan and come back with, especially if we want to start to look at characteristics of what's a good builder, bad builder in this space. We're going to need some. Uh, time to do that yep. analysis no, I, in a thoughtful and, and way. And doing it, fa I get, but but we've been at it a long time, and I have some. I confess to some personal impatience about this as well. All right, I'll, I'll move it as 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 it is. Then, if people can see it, and if anybody else wants to play with it at all, Councillor Henderson, we have um, made a couple of adjustments based on uh, your feedback. Yep. Could you just confirm I'm that just what's on the screen them. now? Yeah. Councillor Henderson is just mm -hmm. reviewing it finally, yep. uh, and he's moving that, correct? Yep. I think so. I think, uh, yeah, uh, and then and just maybe if I can ask just a quick question about it. Um, it looks good to me, so I'll move it and then just ask a question about it. So that's moved, and you want to go ahead and ask a question? Yeah, I, I was a little bit in seeing the report, and because I'm a big fan of this, and this is, you know, sort of how we do engagement. It seems to me, you know, in the work that we've done, which I think was good with both groups, but the fact that we never let them talk to each other seems to me as problematic. Um, us sort of doing shuttle diplomacy between the infill group and the builders, and then you know what I describe as you know tearing the baby in half to try and make everybody happy. I don't think is getting us where we need to go. So um, I'm, I, I would hope, and a question to you, and maybe we need to put it in, in the motion. I think it's implicit in here is that the next work we do, we do with both groups in the room at the same time. Because I don't think we're going to get where we need to go as long as we're mediating the way we are. And, and mediating is probably not the appropriate word, quite frankly, when we're dealing with something like a safety code. And I think that's part of the point that was made to us today, that there's some of the stuff that should be, if we're doing our safety code work properly, should be non-negotiable. Agreed. I think... Um we have the better outcomes when we hear all the perspectives. And so having our city builders, our community um, folks, and the city lens that have a collective conversation and 
definitely wouldn't call it a negotiation. It's a collaborative discussion to work towards the uh, beneficial outcome. So absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I would, that. So that you will read that into, and I wanted to ask that question out loud. I know that's something you'd like to do, but is that implicit in this motion? That yeah. is implicit okay. in this Great. motion and the way that we prefer to work as well. Yep. Good. So I'll have some other questions about the other stuff when okay. we're done, but uh, that's Thank the Thank you. I just wanted to check in with Councillor Katarina that we captured his intent in the motion. Yeah, with uh, number one, yeah, I'm uh, happy with that. And uh, given the, uh, the workload and everything else, uh, working on sort of a tiered system for good, bad, or neutral uh, developers, that uh, is going to require some time, as McCabe, uh, I understand that in, in definitions and uh, maybe the historical uh, information we have on hand uh, might be easier to uh, go from. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with uh, the entire motion uh, and the changes that Councillor Henderson has uh has made to it uh, to make it implicit uh, uh, on, on uh, enforcement and uh, compliance. So, yeah, I'm good. Okay. Did you want to speak to it or you feel confident you're okay with that? No, I'm, I'm fine with that. I don't need to uh, speak okay. to it. I think administration, Ms. McCabe, Ms. Petron, uh, Mr. Ritchie, you, you all get the gist of uh, what we're talking about. And uh, uh, I'm looking forward to that uh, information at SOBA. Okay, and I don't see anyone else on the board, so I will go to Councillor Henderson to close on this motion. Yeah, I'm, I mean, and hopefully we'll have another crack at this sooner rather than later um, when some more work has been done. I, I had, you know, I was intrigued by the suggestion that Ms. Haraba made that maybe it's time if, if we can't use the powers that I think we're obligated to use here, maybe time to have somebody else do it. I think, I, I, I hesitate from using that. I think that's still something that sits in the back pocket here. Um, but I hesitate to sometimes be careful what you wish for and asking the province to step in further distances us from something that we need to deal with. And um, so I don't want to suggest that that wouldn't be something that we shouldn't look at. But I think we need to take another crack ourselves at to using the tools. I think that it now becomes clear to me or available to us to use in a far more meaningful and aggressive, and I use that word very intentionally, uh, manner um, than we have used them in the past. And if we can't, and if we don't, and if, if we're still sitting here, that would be my message, then I think, you know, the more drastic measure is something that could still be considered. I, but I... I, I, I don't know, I can't speak for others, but we've been at this for a long time. Our frustration in the past has always been, we don't, not that we didn't think it was appropriate to, in, to, in, to intervene in this, but that we didn't feel we had the tools. I think it's become clear to me in the process and the conversation we've had recently and the interventions and the things we've heard back from the province, which we didn't have available to us last time, that we do have some tools that we haven't been using as effectively as we could. And, uh, and I, you know, Unexpected things happen, I get that, but it worries me right now that we are planning for, we, we are allowing and accepting that it is, that it is okay to, 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 to plan the 50-50 to damage a neighbor's fence. 50-50, their, their, their property's gonna fall into the hole, and that, to me, shouldn't be acceptable, and that has to shift and change. It may still happen. Um, and, and the obligation will still be on the builder to rectify that situation when it happens. But, but we should, but in terms of our risk tolerances, and I think the building code is all about risk tolerance, the 50-50 yeah, chance of something like that happening doesn't sound to me like an acceptable level of risk. And I think we have to face up to that. And I think the fact that so many builders clearly are managing to do this without having those problems suggests that it is not an impossible hill to, 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 to climb, and it is up to us to make sure that everybody plays by that set of rules and that set of expectations. So um, I put it back. We'll see where, we'll see where we're at. Um, but I think that's the message that I'd like to send loud and clear with this. Whether or not this motion is tough enough to get us there, I'm going to take it on faith that, that that message has been received and that we will step up in a far more meaningful way. Um, and, um, and hopefully... Uh, we can actually deal with this once and for all because I, it's, uh, yeah, I, you know, I've said it many times. If we can't sort this out, it is not fair. It is just not fair to expect the neighbor to take, to take, to take the responsibility that nobody else is prepared to to take, and then to say that they have to go to their insurance company or go to a lawyer in order to deal with a problem that I think we have the tools to deal with. So hopefully, this will get us there. 
And um, yeah, and if not, then we can look at Ms. Sarabas' suggestion next time we have this. Hopefully, we will never have this discussion again. Let's hope. Uh, thank you very much. Very uh, said that very nicely. I am going to call the vote on this motion at this time, so please vote. We're still missing three of four votes. We do have Councillor Henderson's. Mine is spinning, so it's a yes. And so just missing uh, Councillor Katarina's now. Uh, I'm a yes. It's still uh, circling with submitting vote, but. Thank you. We have yeah, four yes. votes, Thank Madam you. Chair. We have all the votes. Display the vote. Uh, and that is carried. Thank you very much. That deals with 6 1. And we need a motion for 6 2 next. I'm still spinning trying to get out of here. Yeah, I think I'm good with 6. I don't think I have any questions. I think my questions are all on 6 3 or 6 4. What's the fire hydrant one? Yeah, I can 6 4. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm prepared to move 6 2 then. So 6 2 is received for information. And 6-3 for that matter. You can do them if you want to do them together. 6-3 is the recommendation to council. Can we do 6-2 and 3 together? Certainly. So Councillor Henderson has moved the recommendations in 6-2 and 3. I see no one on the board, so I will call the vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. It hasn't showed up, but I'm a yes. Thank you. And we also need Councillor Banga's vote. I am a yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you. We have four votes, Madam Chair. Please display the vote. And that is carried. We'll now go to our final item, which is 6-4. Uh, and I think, Councillor Anderson, you had a question. I'll try. Can't click in. Yeah, I just, because I think, and just to do a double check, um, I, we're going to be having a discussion, I think, in a couple of weeks at Utility Committee on, you know, and I realize I've resisted this in the past, but this may be one of the reasons why I shouldn't resist it any longer. Shifting, shifting the fire hydrants to a, to a regulated utility fee um, rather than a tax-based tax fee. And if we can do that, then it would automatically deal with the question of how it gets distributed against around all users and, and the one person who's last in doesn't have to foot the whole bill. Um, so will that give us, if we can go down that road, um, and then negotiated as part of a part of that regulated agreement Would that allow us to open this up a bit more in terms of resources? It, it will we have a window right now with the PBR process, and yep. that's why we're making this recommendation right now It'll give us um, Some funding in this space for the next few years and the idea is through the growth management framework We need to really look at infill and determine what the right tools are to use to be able to get the right okay. uh, Level of funding for infrastructure. And so it, there's a window now yeah. and that's what we're that's what we're uh, Operating under that assumption. Yeah, and it is so and so maybe I, I asked the question because well, you know Obviously, I'll be part of that 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 regulated that that PBR process because that would because we could go back and look at water and wastewater and all those pieces in the same light and deal with because I the other the other thing that that I was interested in and this is I'm going to be a little bit careful because this is something that may or may not come to public here in the future so I'll try and but it's in an area where we have a brand new plan um, it was one of our one of our um, 
uh, one of our, our TOD areas, uh, and we did a plan, um, and, and it was all signed off and every, from the community. We knew that we had inf infrastructure deficiencies when we did the plan, that there was no way to build the plan without dealing with some of the infrastructure pieces, which I think includes water. The trouble is there's one building that's now coming in that can't build to the plan um, because they're going to have to pick up the entire cost for adding some of that deficiency in infrastructure. So their response is going to be to, 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 to ask for a significant change to what's essentially a brand new plan. And I, you know, so it seems to me in some ways we're shooting ourselves in the foot there because in a greenfield situation, we'd have a way of distributing that amongst more than one, one new builder. But in this case, in an infill situation, we don't have that mechanism. Um, and, I, and the result is we could end up undermining the original intent of the plan because somebody, somehow or other, we've got to pay for this infrastructure. So are there tools around that that we might be able to build into the PBR as well that could distribute that in a different kind of way? Uh, potentially, but not in this PBR. So that's okay. exactly the work the department has to do over the next few years is how do we mature our processes around infill and infrastructure costs associated with infill about where we're trying to direct growth through the nose and corridors work. And uh, we're doing some initial scoping uh, with that work right now, uh, understanding some of the infill infrastructure requirements as well as the mechanisms to pay for them through the growth management framework. So, so this is really just a... This, the work, this becomes a kind of, this was a successful program. It's a bit of a placeholder until we can deal with this in a more fundamental way, probably as part of those PBR discussions. That's correct. Okay. Oh, I realized, really, I'm going to cheat a little bit here because it's not really part of this item, but uh, the 25% infill numbers, which were impressive, um, but I, one of the things that I worry about a little bit, and if we could do some analysis on this, because we said we would never get to 25%, and for years we didn't, but I think that's because there was so much greenfield construction. I suspect the fact we're doing way better right now is because greenfield construction, construction is down. So is there a way to crunch numbers that can track that in a different kind of way so that we're understanding it not just to, as a proportion, but actually uh, I think we need to start looking at that, that metric in a different way that actually gives us a, an idea of how much is actually happening and not just the proportion of what's getting built. Yeah, understood. And uh, part of uh, working on the targets uh, for the next interim, for the next 10 years for the city plan, we'll be looking at exactly how we're going to yeah. report. We've got the numbers. We've got the data. Uh, yeah, I just think that percentage one is interesting for a different reason, but I think it's giving us a warped idea of success and failure. You know, I think we were succeeding four years ago, but it looked like we were failing and now it's reversed and that probably has more to do with the quantity of greenfield development than it has to do with how much infill we're doing. I know Sean Boley's on the line and perhaps he could give yeah. you some context yeah. to that if you'd like the answer to the question. Sure. And then I'm done. Um, I'll, I'll just add to the conversation that uh, the, the increase in percentage for infill isn't just reflective of a decline in greenfield. We're looking at the highest absolute numbers of infill development uh, in 2020 of any year we've had before. Yeah, no, so we are looking at a variety of numbers. Good. I just think we need to start tracking it because I think it, I just think I was deceptive in the other direction. About four or five years ago, we were doing much better than we thought we were because the numbers were reversed in terms of. So great, thank you. Be great to see those at some point. Thank you, and understand you've moved six four as well. Yeah. Thank you. I see no one else on the board. Uh, so I will call the question on 6-4, receiving for information. Yes, for me, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. We're just missing your vote, Madam Chair. I'm a yes. I'm Thank still you. waiting for it to come. We have four votes. Uh, display the vote. And that is carried. Thank you very much. Great work today. Uh, any notices of motion? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you. Good night, all. <laughs>